All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is June 26th, 2023. And we will keep studying. We will keep seeking and searching, watching and praying as we try to endure these next 30 or so days that we are watching with open eyes. We are like the almond shell that is open. The, it's like watching, right? That is what we're doing. You're going to see why I mentioned that in a little bit. It's pretty awesome. And we're just going to cover a bunch of things today, uh, but with a focus, as you'll notice from the title, <clears throat> I'm sure I'm going to stick with the title, uh, the Shemitahs, or Sabbath years, as many people know them. We have the chart, and we've we've gone through this chart in parts and pieces over the last several months since it was completely laid out. I, I haven't been able to find a single glitch in it. So this time, as I've said over a number of videos, you know, Mike over on 165 had mentioned maybe he wanted to do something just briefly. Well, I'm going to take some time to, to go through it all, to show how from the birth of Christ to the end of the tribulation years, it's all lined up. So we're going to spend some time in that. We're going to touch on things before we get into it. And then we're going to break that down and go right to the 70 years and these connections and these time frames. And then very little on the 14 years within the events that will take place during it uh, because we cover that so much. But this is something that I've mentioned for a little while now. And so I thought it'd be a good one to do it. You'll notice also it's a, it's a day later than I usually do in between videos. And for those that didn't know, we were on uh, Interrupts 165, our brother Mike. Uh, put out a video and I was doing a, the live show there with them on Saturday. So anybody that was watching knew that I said I wasn't going to do a video on Sunday, but I would do it on Monday instead. So there was that extra day in between. So people can get the chance to watch that live show and, and dig into scripture and, and come to understand these things for themselves. It was a lot less on prophecy, right? Our focus here in this ministry is the revelation of prophecy. It's been going on for five and a half, six years, and uh, it's just been an awesome journey. And, and today we're going to see that even more by breaking down this Shemitah year chart that we have. You know, I've always said, one of our brothers, Mark, that I talk to on the phone regularly, you know, it, it was always said, look, we don't have to go back all the way to Christ to, to figure out the year count and how it works like this and how it works like that. And no, all we needed was when they came back into the land. That was what we needed. The issue was, you know, the whole world of prophecy, as you guys know, we've mentioned it many times, the whole world of prophecy was talking about the 70th year of Israel as it was the most important period of time because it's all throughout prophecy, 70 years, 70 years, 70 years, 70 years. Yet, when it came and went, there was no more talk about it and as far as I know, we're the only ministry that continued to dig into it. And I believe we've been rewarded. As we cover this today and as we go through this and being now able, never mind just going back to when they became a nation, but being able to take it all the way back to the birth of Christ, to the year, the time of his birth, to, to um, when he was baptized, to all of it connected to Scripture to when they came into the land, what the scriptures told them about when they came into the land, how many years is left, what would happen at that year, how it would play out, what was before, what was during the 14. I mean, it's <laughs> it's over the top, you know. And I'm not going to say we get complacent. We definitely don't com get complacent, but we get so used to to more and more and more revelation that, you know, sometimes we forget and we, we forget to pause and say, Dude, this is this is over the top. We've been so blessed. The Spirit has led this entire thing in Christ Jesus, in the will of the Father, to make his revelation known. Does it mean it's all perfect? No, absolutely not. More than it's ever been revealed in human history? Absolutely, 100%. Just let that sink in for a moment, right? It's crazy to sit back and to realize everything we've been revealed. And then what do we do? And I'm no different. I'm including myself in this. What do we do? Oh, Lord, 
what more can you give us, Lord? Can you help us with this, Lord? Can you give us? <laughs> and then I feel like a fool when I do it, you know? It's just that uh, we always need more. We need that thing to, to, to take us a little bit further, to, to strengthen us just that little bit more. You know, I couldn't imagine if there was another year to go. I'm thinking, oh, no, you know? But do I think so? No, you guys know that I don't. Is it possible? I haven't heard a thus saith the Lord. It's been through revelation. But when you see what we know, when you see the Shemitah year count and, and the entire thing laid out, it's going to be hard to dispute. And so when you add it with the recent videos, when you add it with the let's be clear and the grapes of wrath and, and the connection to Taurus and, and how the count starts, <laughs> it's really pretty crazy. It's really, really insane. And you're going to see a little bit more of that today because when we talk about this, I'm going to bring something else in as a possible watch in Israel that might be coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, not as an escape, okay? Not as, as an escape, but maybe an event that will happen. Because one of the things I know so many of us are looking for is something to happen biblically, excuse me, that we can point to. Something biblically we can point to that says, if this happens, hold on to your horses, get ready to go, the time is at hand. Now, when I'm going to show you this, when we're going to get into that piece, it's, it's not saying it is this, this is going to happen, but I'm going to show you why I'm saying it as a possibility and why I'm mentioning it now is because as I was talking about these recent videos in Taurus, it's fascinating that it's the count of Taurus from the month of Savan being seen as in the beginning as month one, because in the beginning of creation, it was Taurus as the beginning of the year. And it was the 16th day of Taurus that began everything. And we're counting the 16th day of Taurus, the day after Jesus's birthday, the 16th day of the third month as a type of resurrection day, just as it was in the beginning. So was Christ in the first month, 16th day of the beginning. For those that are new, it may not make sense, but it's all connected to revelation we've received over the years, and especially the last three years, with a word from the Holy Ghost that, that what I had taught was right on target, was a word from the Holy Ghost, given by a sister over a video I had done, and there, there's a whole story behind it. It's the only thing I've ever received uh, knowingly outside of the revelation of Scripture. And, uh, you know when you see the things that are connected to it like is is it just chance that you count seven sabbaths and then from the following day you number 50 days and it's the fasting of the morning of the fifth and the fasting of the morning of the seventh i mean you, you it's not even you can't make that up it's it's right on the remaining 50 days well this type of thing that you're going to see when we make the point on this is also connected to the exact same date when we use account from Taurus. It's wild. So those are the things we're going to get into. We're going to cover all sorts of things within that. And, um, oh, I wanted to tell you guys as well, I just got an email uh, late this afternoon. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of them. I hadn't heard of them before. They saw me on um, Deep Believer when I did the video, uh, the live show with her about um, uh, uh, the three raptures, you know, the the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to, Luke, Mark, and Matthew, pre, mid, post. And they saw the video, and they want me to come on, and it's called uh, Tribulation Now Radio. So I don't know when. I'll reach out to her tomorrow and uh, see what the process is, see how long it takes before we can get on. And uh, they give you an hour to talk, and John, the, the guy, will jump in every once in a while, but just says, lay it all out, and... I'll have an hour to, to talk about it based on what I was told in the email. And then questions will come in from the audience that listens from all over the world. They generally have thousands of people listening from around the world. And occasionally they even get uh, 10,000 plus people listening from around the world. So that'll be another great outlet, I believe, to be able to, to get the word out there, to get the revelation out there. Because uh, the lady that works with John was just blown away and was quite fascinated by the revelation that we were talking about in that video uh, with Deep Believer. So that's exciting news. So look forward to that. Um, anybody, you know, when I post or when I'm going to share these things, I'll probably share it in an upcoming video. 
But because we have four or five days between videos, if it happens later this week, you won't hear about it if you're on YouTube. Um, what you could do is you can come to our website right here. You can go to ministryrevealed.com or you can click right here on the website. And on the website, we have a forum and it's free to sign up. There's 11, 1,200 people from all over the world. Uh, from nations everywhere, and we're in prayer, uplifting each other, doing Bible studies, news, events, things going on, um, all sorts of like-minded people watching, praying, and diligently seeking the Lord. You can come in there, and in there is where I would make the post. So other than that, if it happens early and it's before the next video, you won't hear about it unless you're connected to the forum, um, or you would have to wait till the next video, and I would let you guys know about it. Maybe I'll include a link and so forth. Uh, so that was exciting. I thought I would share that. And for anybody that's new, I got to do this every time. I'll make it quick. You're going to hear, as you've just heard me say, pre, mid, and post are all true. Yes, they're all true. You're going to hear things like the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to, that the first will be last and the last will be first. That's the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke. In the end of days, it's Luke, Mark, Matthew. It is going to blow you away as you begin to understand it. <clears throat> there's two places you can go and you're going to hear things like you see right here where the 14 year tribulation understanding and the open books are revealed when you hear 14 years it freaks most people out and they think you're a nut job right off the bat i promise you it's 100 percent true it is all throughout scripture we'll touch on some parts of it today because it's just part of the storyline as you reveal revelation we do it from the beginning of Genesis right to the end of Revelation, and you're going to see it's absolutely true, and you should not fear, you should rejoice, because if it's 14 years, and it is, when not seven, then that means the pre-trib is seven years earlier than what the world thinks seven years is. You see what I'm saying? So it's really wild to understand, and where you can go is you can go to the website, go to the menu box, and you can click on intro series or intro videos and you listen to them there in order, it will blow your mind. The other place you can go because you're here listening on YouTube is you click on the playlist link right here. You come to this playlist video series right here called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. Click on this. I think this is and start with these four videos right here. This one right here, this 22-minute video. It's a simple, straightforward 22-minute video to begin to give you the insight of this 30-minute Bible study that reveals who the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke are speaking to, then the 14-year tribulation that once you begin to understand the revelation of these mysteries that are hidden within the Gospels that are all prophetic, these things that, that people thought were contradictions, they were all hidden prophecy for the is to come. You're going to see that it's Luke, Mark, Matthew in the end of days, pre, mid, post. You're going to see that the Luke group, the, the bride of Christ, that Gentile bride of Christ who goes first is the one who goes above 14 years. The mid-trib great multitude rapture is at the end of the sixth seal in the seventh year of seals between the end of the sixth seal and before the seventh seal starts. It'll be up somewhere around the middle of the sixth year, uh, the seventh year of seals. That is the mid-trib great multitude rapture. That is the Mark group. And then the end of the 14 years, or after 13 years, and the Lord comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. The Lord is here feet down on the Mount of Olives. That is the post-trib. You're going to begin to see it revealed. You're even going to see it literally said above 14 years in Scripture. And you're going to say, what? It's all prophetically built in to the Gospels into the epistles it's everywhere throughout the old testament it even goes back all the way to the entirety of creation that's how fascinating it is so this will begin to give you the intro into the gospels this will begin to reveal to you the 14 years and how it lays out this one here is the reason why the whole world has missed it it's called it's all because of matthew and the reason of all because it's matthew is because the entirety of seminaries, of churches, of, of everybody throughout the world has made their foundation in the Gospel of Matthew. So when your entire foundation is the Jewish perspective, because Matthew is written to Judah, okay, 
Matthew is written to the Jews. Mark is written to the world. You can say, you know, the church that's still asleep in the world, right? The Gentiles are grafted in. So it's, it's the house of Israel that's scattered throughout the world and the Gentiles that were grafted in. That's the sleeping church portion. And then you've got Luke, which is the pre-trib bride of Christ. And you're going to see that when everybody's foundation comes from the gospel of Matthew, everything they see prophetically, they try to connect to this seven year period of time. And that's why there's been so many debates and arguments and separations of churches between whether pre-trib, mid-trib or post-trib is true. Before this all started happening to me, I used to believe in pre-trib. Then I saw a video and I started looking into those scriptures of mid-trib and I was like, man, oh my goodness, this is mid-trib. And I started being like, oh man, we're gonna have to endure till, till the end of seals. And back then I only thought three and a half years. No, oh, we're gonna have to wait till seals. And then somebody else said, no, seals have already played out. We're just waiting for the sixth seal. And then it's the great multitude rapture. And what the heck was going on? I was scratching my head on all this stuff. And then you'd read the other scriptures again. And then you'd be pre-trib. And you're like, uh, what is it? Is it pre? Is it mid? Is it post? We know there's a post because the Lord returns feet down. But then you go read Matthew's discourse and everybody tells you that when you see the Lord coming there, there's like, see, that's pre-trib. No, it says immediately after the tribulation of those days. Uh, that's not pre-trib. In fact, it's actually post-trib. And these are the types of things that are revealed in the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to and in the 14 years. These are just 30 minute intros. This is the intro of all three of these. And then each of these two are the intro of their related topic. And then this is the reason to explain and to reveal that Mark and Luke in the Synoptic Gospels were never taken into consideration properly who they were directly speaking to. And when you begin to understand that, you realize there was another seven year miss that speaks to Mark's group. And this small period of time, which represents 50 days, that relates to Luke's group. You're going to see that pre, mid, and post is all true. You'll be able to see the discourses revealed in order. The tribulation from Revelation 6 to Revelation 14 laid out in order. It's really, truly fascinating. The end time seven churches revealed. I promise you, it'll be worth every moment of your time. It's extremely, extremely exciting. You can also go again to ministryrevealed.com. And at ministryrevealed.com, you could, you could uh, read the book from the book page. Um, you can download the book in free PDF in five different languages. Or you can listen to it in English right there from the website. Or you might have to download the, to listen to it. Or if you wanted a paperback, you, then you would have to go to Amazon. All right, so it's available. It's for free. If you want paperback, you can, you can always get that as well. So... It's extremely exciting. The evidence is everywhere. We're close to 500 videos on YouTube alone. And it's been nothing but this revelation. Hours, hundreds and thousands of hours of videos and teachings. It's, it's awesome. All right. So let's get going into this. And I wanted to start with this before we got started. Man, it bothers me. I get these tabs opened, and when I have these tabs open, they reset when I go to them because I have so many things open. But I wanted to share this with you. Um, I don't remember. I, I, somebody may have shared it with me. I don't recall now. It may have been shared in the forum, or, or I saw it and I posted it in the forum. I can't recall now. But we're just going to watch a, about a minute or two of this. I thought it was awesome. Because, you see, it, it's one of those things to remind us of this season and time that we're in. You know, we've got the Russia thing and the Ukraine and the buildup of military and the 300 being reserved to be brought up to, to go into Ukraine. And, and you see what's going on with um, uh, the rebellion with, what was it one of the generals or the, the, the extras there with uh, going against Russia. You see what's going on with Iran and with Syria and, all, and Hezbollah and all these things and coming against Israel. And, a lot of people will say, well, so many of these things have been going on for years. How do we really know? Right? Well, Luke, in Luke chapter 12, the Lord tells us, look, 
you can look up at the sky and you can say, oh, when the wind comes from this way or the clouds come from that way, you can know it's going to rain or it's going to be sunny or it's going to be warm. And yet you can't tell the season that you're living in. You see, watchmen and watchwomen, when, when the watchmen are watching and you can say, ah, oh, they've been watching for centuries. That's true because every generation should have watchmen. You get it? But eventually the time will come when the revelation will begin. Wouldn't you rather be watching? Wouldn't you rather be ready? Right? So what we do here is we, not, we don't focus too much on talking about the events around the world, but we do bring them up and we show connections to them. And then when we're in the forum, we, we share on a lot of these things because it's going on everywhere in the world right now. And why would it be going on so much more intensely now? Maybe because the 70 years is coming to an end? You see? What about the mark of the beast? What about all these things that are building? What about the whole COVID thing? Everybody's, you know, life is back to normal, right? You didn't need to have the COVID, uh, 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 the vaccines. You didn't need to worry about any of that stuff. There's no more QR codes. All this stuff is done. It's gone. Everybody's back to normal. Live your life, everybody. Are you sure about that? Let's listen to this. Some people in our world advocating for a global world government, a governance that would allow some individual or small group of individuals to control the rest of the world. That's been the goal of despots and dictators throughout human history. But we're seeing it happen before our very eyes. Today on Prophetic Perspective, we have a very special guest who has just returned from a meeting of the World Health Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. Congresswoman Michelle Bachmann, who served for a number of years in the U.S. House of Representatives and ran for president of the United States, continues to serve as dean of Regents College and as a voice for conservative and Christian principles here in America and around the world. Congresswoman Bachman, tell us a little bit about what you experienced when you went to Geneva, Switzerland, and were a part of at least the uh, audience listening to all the things going on at the World Health Organization. I was there watching, observing, seeing it. They weren't shy. They weren't reticent to tell us what was going on. What was very sad is there wasn't one member of the U.S. House of Representatives that was there for this meeting. There wasn't one member of the United States Senate that was there. They managed to find airplanes and attend World Economic Forum meetings, but they didn't attend this meeting. And this is, has such profound consequences for every person on Earth, because the plan envisioned is that every person on Earth Earth would come under the dominion and control of the World Health Organization. It was just Monday of this week, one week after the World Health Assembly concluded that there was a, an actual absolute bombshell press, uh, a press letter that went out that said the European Union has already developed a global digital passport that would regulate um, the ability of people to take transportation and it would also regulate our health issues. That global digital passport, which essentially would be a QR code on your mobile phone, an individual would have to be in compliance with the mandates of the World Health Organization in order to be able to travel, in order to be able to move about. So this was announced on Monday. They didn't wait to pass amendments or pass a global treaty. They announced that the World Health Organization is adopting what Europe came up with that already covers 80 countries out of the 194. The question is, when will the United States go into the system? Because this is how you enforce global government through this global digital passport. It is a reality. And Monday, it was announced that the WHO will take over the European uh, digital passport. And they also stated this will be the first building block, presumably merging digital currency, digital health records. Our entire life will eventually be merged onto this digital QR code. And okay, did you hear that? So this was back in early June. So this was, I think, the first uh, Monday in June that this actually launched. Now, you heard her say that it included... It was for your digital passport, which means anybody that's going to want to travel, you're going to have to be vaccinated. It's going to have your health records. We know there's going to be a connection to digital currency, which U.S. through New York did the testing in America. And these things are already ready to be launched. They've, they've done it in, in areas, but not that it's complete digital currency, but they did it for like, what is it, swift transactions or certain transactions, but it is the background for what is gonna be brought about. But what, what has to happen first? You see, what has to happen? We know war has to break out. The, there has to be an actual war to break out, to bring destruction to nations, to bring people into obedience. You see, all of these things are prepared. Does it remind you of the very first video Minister Reveal did on June 6th, uh, 16th of 2017? This was before I realized what was happening in, in, in my life. It wasn't until September 8th of 2017 that I realized what was happening. My first video was a two-part video. This is part one. They were both about 30 minutes long, and it was an incredible revelation about the potential for the mark of the beast. Now, right now, they have it on the phone. 
well, is it still going to be phone systems in when when tribulation and world war breaks out? Is everybody still going to be walking around with their phone plans, paying uh, what 200, 300 bucks a month for their family phone plans, and everybody walking around with a phone, or will it be changed to something else? All right, may very well be that it's that it's the phone, but we know it's on. Right, we know that the scriptures tell us that the word in doesn't actually mean in, it means on the right hand or on the forehead, okay? So is it necessarily a phone? That's the way they're starting it, but will it remain that way? Is it gonna be a chip or is it gonna be some sort of tattoo? Like a QR code. You see, this is something that I spoke about in the video that I did, and it was about something that everybody knew, that Vera chip, right? So that Vera chip company made it look like the eye and everybody was talking about it. Well, when they went away, they changed. They didn't actually go away. They changed to a company called Positive ID. And Positive ID and the things that I spoke about in the video, check this out. Here it is in the video, these things that I shared. So they merged. So Digital Angel is a company that Vera chip or Positive ID merged with. And Digital Angel, look at what they did. The company formerly developed global positioning systems, GPS, auto frequency, RFIDs. So these, these marks, the, the, whether it's a chip under or it's, it's a tattoo, whatever it is, it will be able to communicate. And what is it? It's a GPS or an RFID within that technology. Well, isn't that exactly what your phones do? Right? It could very well start off with your phone. Well, what else was it? So not only did Verichip merge with Digital Angel, which had the RFID technology, what else did they do? They also came to be with a company called Seed Vault, uh, sorry, Steel Vault Corporation. So you had Digital Angel, you had Positive ID, so you had the chip developer, you had RFID GPS tracking, you had Steel Vault. Well, what was Steel Vault? Check this out. We go to Steel Vault. And Steel Vault, look at what Steel Vault is. So it's under the IFTH acquisition, and they were doing business as Steel Vault. What did they do? National Credit Report, you see, is a premier provider of identity security products and services, including credit monitoring, credit reports, and other identity theft protection services. All of these guys, all of this. As I even said in this video back in the day, it will make no difference what the company name will be, whether it was Verichip at one point and it's Positive ID then, or whatever it will be. It's going to be the technology that is merged together that will end up getting used in the end of days for the Mark of the Beast. Here's the other piece where you find info on them. Okay, so we've got what? Tracking? You've got um, uh, the chip itself or whatever the mark might be. You have a uh, credit report, right? Isn't that what they're doing already in China? Shaming people, right, for bad credit? For, for I shouldn't say for bad credit, but for anything they do against the government? Well, what else do you have here with positive ID? Listen to this. Positive IG, ID, formerly Verichip, is a biological detection system developer uh, for North uh, for America's homeland security industry. Now, do you remember this? They did rapid medical testing technology. I remember this one really kind of had my my mom scratching her head because when I went to visit her, you guys know when she had that operation, COVID had just started, and this was in uh, right close to the fall of 2020 that I went to visit her, and COVID had started, and I showed her this video that I did, that at this time of the end. You're going to see this this brought about, and what is it? Tracking people coming in and out of countries, testing them for viruses. This company was also involved in that. In the video, I talk about PCR machines. This was back in 2017, in June of 2017, and this company involved in all these other things that I've said was also the company involved with these, these machines that they would use to test for PCR testing craziness right well there's more because it says uh it is most known for developing the only food and drug administration approved human implantable microchip 
Okay, positive ID, manufactured, full length. What was the other thing I wanted to show? Uh, in the right arm, <laughs> in the right arm, uh, frequency, positive ID, subsidiary, database verification. Oh, here it is right here. So the positive ID responds with a unique 16-digit number, uh, which could be then linked to information the user uh, information about the user held on database for identity verification. Look at this. Medical records access and other uses. You see why? Because they were even approved with the FDA. So you've got medical records, you've got your credit history and your credit score, you've got your you'll have your banking on it, you'll have your 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 chip info, your ability whether you could fly or not fly. And here they are talking about this thing that most of the world thinks is already gone. It, it's already done. Ah, oh, we can go back to live our lives. No, you can't. The COVID was just the setup. COVID was to begin to implement all of this. We know this from the video that was given to me. This video right here we've shared many times over the years. It is this video that was given to me with the word from the Holy Ghost. And this video that we've shared numerous times said from 2010, from 2010, look at that. 2010 said that a, a virus would be released on China. China would be catch a cold. And when they catch a cold, it would either mutate and it would spread throughout the West there would be military type uh, um, uh, um, uh, martial law lockdown. It would spread throughout the West and all of this stuff. And that was just the beginning. It was the setup for what would then come, which would be a short attack in the Middle East. It wouldn't last very long. There would be a ceasefire. And then World War III would break out. It is everything we've been teaching, except. We did not know that a virus was going to be released first. But the virus was needed to bring about what? This. And this, simply in a different format, is the exact same thing as the first video that I did. And it just so happens that the first video I did was also included with this company. They were the ones that did the PCR machines for testing for viruses going in and out of nations. You see, guys, there is no way we've got years and years and years to go. The scriptures are riddled with the revelation of 70 years. The issue has always been understanding those 70 years. And now we've got one that ends and another one that ends and from the end of one to an, and at the end of another is precisely 14 years. How much more do we need? Well, let me now share something else that I found was very interesting. This is what I was talking to you guys with uh, a little bit earlier. The 17th of Tammuz. So the 17th of Tammuz is a fast day, right? We know this one. Generally, most people know this one. But if we go into Zechariah chapter 8, in Zechariah chapter 8, Zechariah chapter 8 represents, for those that are newer, it has 14 chapters, just like Hosea. There are only two books in the entire Bible that have 14 chapters. One is written to the Gentiles slash house of Israel, and the other one is written to Judah, the house of Judah. We see this, we've known this, we've understood it, and within it is the revelation of the 14 years. Well, when you get to seven years of seals complete, you're now at the beginning of trumpets, the first year of trumpets. There's the Lord on heavenly Mount Zion. You know, I watched a video the other day. I think it was shared in the forum. And the guy was doing a teaching on um, on the seven years of tribulation. And of course, you know, I, I always have to bite my tongue because all I want to do is jump on and put in comments. Right. But I'm like, it's OK. I know that the world doesn't understand these things yet. So so I'm listening to it. and. Isn't it interesting? Oh, that's what it was. I, and I really like this brother too. It was uh, Nelson Walters. It was Nelson Walters 
and it was about um, going into the uh, second Esdras, which is the apocryphal book. And he was talking about how Jesus references 24 times quotes from passages in second Esdras, which is an apocryphal book. And we've gone to it many times, right? Of course, I'm not going to go into it all again. But you go to chapter 13, starting in verse 29, even to, to verse 40, it's literally the pre-trib escape to the end of seals. It's absolutely phenomenal. Deliver those, Most High is going to deliver those who are on the earth, right? This is the pre-trib. You have bewilderment of mind. Then they're going to plan to make war against, another, against one another. This is red horse rider, city against city, nation against nation. Then all these things that I've told you, which represents the seals times, he says, then my son will be revealed. Okay? Then my son will be revealed. An innumerable multitude will come, gather to come and conquer him. This is the this is the um, Ezekiel 39 war. This is the end of the sixth year of seals. And then people read this. But he shall stand on the top of Mount Zion, and Zion will come to be made manifest to all people prepared and built as you saw a mountain carved without hands. Well, hold on a second. If this is the Lord coming, when he returns at the end of tribulation, for those that only believe in seven years, got a problem, don't you? What's he doing on Mount Zion? What is he doing on Mount Zion? Doesn't he return? Don't you guys all go to Re uh, Zechariah chapter 14? Right? In 14 verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem to the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave. See that? That is not Mount Zion. Where is Mount Zion? Well, lo and behold, at the end of seals, when he's seen coming on heavenly Mount Zion, at the end of the sixth year of seals, and the world's freaking out, this is that innumerable multitude coming to gather against them because the whole world is freaking out. They're hiding in caves and a bunch of them will gather themselves to come and fight against them. And then he'll what? Stand on Mount Zion. Where do you get him being on Mount Zion? Well, here's the Lord, jealous for Zion with great jealousy and jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. You see, a lot of people like to start their seven-year tribulation by going to Zechariah 8, but they certainly can't explain the, the propheticness of him being on Mount Zion, this Mount Zion being made manifest, and then seeing that they're going to start rebuilding the temple but yet the temple had to be laid on a foundation. And that's what Zechariah chapter 4 says. That in Zechariah chapter 4, the foundation was laid. You see, it's not easy to, uh, it's not easy to, to you, you have to skip over a whole bunch of things when you only have a seven-year understanding. You have, to, you have to mishmash seals and trumpets over each other. And you have to say, well, he's on Mount Zion. Well, really, it's Mount of Olives, but... Well, why is it in Zechariah 8 and why is it in Zechariah 14, right? You got them both right there in the same book. But what we see here, as I went off on a little tangent, is in the first year of trumpets, in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 19, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be unto the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts, Therefore, love the truth and peace. Okay? When is this going to happen? That means Judah's going to be there. And we've taught on this a number of times. Judah will also come in. So when the great multitude rapture comes in, Judah is going to recognize, because you've got to remember, the house of Judah, the Jews that are in the land right now, which is the house of Judah, they are looking for their Messiah, who will come and destroy all the enemies who came against him to destroy them. Well, that's what he's doing at the end of the sixth seal. And when he comes, the temple is going to be rebuilt. And that's what he's doing at the start of trumpets. It's not the Antichrist. 
You see? But that's what happens. They mix the Antichrist with when the Son of Man comes as on heavenly Mount Zion, when he's seen at the end of the sixth seal. He's here for that seventh year. And then trumpets begins with the rebuilding, brings them in the land and rebuilds. Well, Judah is also going to be there. So the fasting of the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth will now be gladness unto them. But when we were in Zechariah 7, and we've taught on this many times over the years, we have only a specific mention of the fasting and mourning of the fifth and the one of the seventh, those 70 years. So what is this one of the fourth, and why am I bringing, up, bringing it up now? Check this out. The 17th of Tammuz, okay? Which is the 17th day of the fourth month. Well, just as we've shown, and just as I was talking about the, the revelation that we know of, that Sivan is the month of Taurus. Not maybe, not kind of, it is Taurus. And we know to the early Hebrews, Taurus was the first constellation in the zodiac and consequently was represented by the first letter of their alphabet. Taurus, you see, the Lord is called the beginning and the end, right? The Aleph and the Tav, right? What is that? What is Aleph? Taurus. Taurus is the Aleph. Taurus is the head of Taurus. And this is something we've taught on many times over the years, over the last three years. We know that the month of Sivan, the third Hebrew month, which is May, generally May into June, is when the sun is in Taurus. Okay? The sun, the moon comes in. It might be just on the outskirts of it, and then it comes through. It's just to the tail end of the horns, and then it goes into the next month. Sivan is the month of Taurus. We've talked about how when, when the Lord told Moses in Exodus 12, this is the beginning of your years, this is the beginning, the first of your months, it was Taurus. We've explained how if we take a clock and we move the, the hour and the minute hands like the sun and the moon, whether the battery is going really quick or if the battery is dying and the hands are moving too slowly, does it change the 12 numbers on the face of the clock? No, it doesn't. But yet, we've moved, because of the sun, we've moved now two months sooner. So that this is now the third month. So what we've been saying is we've been watching for this count to it. And now we're in this count that follows it because we know the revelation of right on target is Taurus. It's bullseye. It's the eye of the bull. It's the revelation of the head of Taurus and the meaning of it. Well, we also know that from the words in the beginning, it was in Taurus, and the word beginning means the first fruits of the Feast of First Fruits. You guys all know this, right? The, the Hebrew word 7225, which is the Feast of First Fruits, that is the one without leaven, which is Jesus Christ. That date of in the beginning was literally this day right here. It was the 16th day in Taurus at the beginning of creation, in the beginning. We know that this is Jesus's birthday, which was the third month. We know as the first month in Taurus, this represented the creation. And so what do you get? We, we did just as this, we went just like his death and resurrection, or his death and his resurrection. Well, isn't it fascinating that Jews, Jews have a tradition and they believe that the, the major figures in the Old Testament died at the time of their birth. It's interesting, right? Well, isn't it fascinating that from the 15th, if this is represented as the first month, that Jesus's birthday being the month of Sivan, which is the third month in his day, right? Or the third month now, we know that he was born on Sivan. If we go back to the creation, if we go back to the, to the storyline of how the beginning is the end and the end is the beginning, there's like his death. This is representative of what? This, we're, we're looking at Savan as it was in the beginning, as it was when the father told Moses, this is the beginning of your year and the beginning of your months. It was the month of Taurus. 
So if Moses was here, we've said this a lot recently, if Moses was here and he looked up into the sky, he would know, well, now we're in Tammuz, but he would have known when he was, when we were in the month of Sivan, he would have said, this is the first month. So if it was the first month, then this would have been Passover. This would have been when he was in the grave and this would have been resurrection. So at resurrection, what do we count? This is when you begin to count your seven Sabbaths. So we've got one, when you understand to count that it's the 8th, 15th, 22nd, 29th, there's one Sabbath, two Sabbaths, three Sabbaths, four, five, six, seven Sabbaths. I find it amazing that in account, doing as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Whoever finds the beginning finds the end and will not taste of death. That when we count as it was in the beginning, and we do the, Shmi, uh, the, the, the Feast of Weeks count, we get to the 50th day, uh, sorry, to the seventh Sabbath, and then number 50 days. The ninth of Av takes us to the 29th day of Elul, the last day of the year. That is fascinating. It's, it's absolutely in alignment with the fifth and seventh month, saying that they fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, those 70 years, but they would not do it again. Well, there might be something else we can find in connection. Now, I am not going to say that this is the connection. I'm not saying that this is the, the Tammuz fourth month fasting and mourning and that it is going to be part of the beginning. But I am going to share this with you because there was a reason why I was explaining and reiterating Sivan being as it was in the beginning. So that's the way it was in the beginning of creation. That's what it was even at the time of Moses. Well, do you know what else it was? So was it at the time of Noah, right? In Noah's time, Sivan, Taurus, well, not Sivan, but Taurus, which is now Sivan, was also the first month of the year. Well, what do we get in Genesis chapter 7? And I'm going to explain why I'm not saying I believe this is going to be the connection, but I'm going to share it with you because of a possibility that, hey, we are looking for something to give us a clue, something that can maybe give us a little bit more strength, right? This is what we were talking about. Something to give us a little bit more strength. And hopefully in seeing this, we would know, oh my goodness, hold on to your horses. Okay? So when we count from Savan, as it was in the beginning, we do the, the seven Sabbaths count, and then we've got the 50 days to, to Pentecost, and it just so happens, this is the time that the two wave loaves come in. It just so happens, the second to the third week of September is when the new wine is ready. So not only is it just coincidental that when you do a count from as it was in the beginning as the first month, you end up exactly with a count to the fifth and seventh. You end up exactly at a count with the two wave loaves that have been going on for hundreds of years. You end up exactly at the time of the new wine when it's literally harvested. This is literally the end of the winter wheat harvest. This is literally the end of the wine of the grapes harvest. Well, guess what else? It just so happens that if Savan Taurus, as we're counting it as month one, what would month two be? Tammuz. So if this is month one because of Taurus, then that means Tammuz is month two. What's the 17th day of the second month? It would be the 17th of Tammuz. You see what I'm getting at? I want to I wanna make sure you're just grasping what I'm showing you. We're counting this, even though it's the third month, we're counting it as it was in the beginning. And even though this is the fourth month, this is the third month, this is the fourth month, this is the fifth month, this is the seventh month, 
when we count from as it was in the beginning and do the count of the Feast of Weeks, we get to the literal dates of the fifth month and seventh month, even though it would be as what? The third month and the fifth month. Yet it lands on the biblical dates of the fourth month, the fifth month, the seventh month, but the counts are exactly the same. I find that wild. And this is no different. In Noah's day, Sivan or Taurus was month one, which means Tammuz or what is it, uh, Gemini, in Moses' day, in the beginning, in Noah's day. This would have been month two. And this was the 17th day of the second month. Well, why does that matter? It just so happens we're given that exact date. The exact date. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, 17th day of the month, the same day were all the floods of the great broken up. Do I think, now I'm going to give you two points on this. First of all, knowing that it was Taurus, that makes Tammuz month two, right? That makes Gemini the second month in Moses' day, and it's the 17th day. So by starting from Taurus, we actually get the fasting in the morning event of the breaching of the walls, which is what the 17th of Tammuz is about. We have the breaching of the walls event as the second day, 17th month. We have the, the ninth of Av as the beginning of 50 days. We have the end of Elul as the year's end when Syria comes to attack, just as scripture said, and the beginning of 14 years as Tishri won. All of this exactly in the places where they are on the Hebrew calendar, yet perfectly counted when we count Sivan as the beginning of the year. I thought that was pretty wild. So what I'm suggesting is that we pay attention on our side of the world from the 5th into the 6th of July. We should have our eyes paying attention and our ears paying attention to see if there's any type of event, any type of, of attack that, you know, compromises maybe something in Israel. Just, just something to keep an eye on. Why? Because it's right here. But as I've told you guys in the past, I'm going to give you the other side of this. I'm only looking at this because one, it's part of the fasting and mourning events. It's part of the event that the breaching of the walls that happened before the attack that happened on Jerusalem and destruction of the temple. Okay. We know in this period of time, it's not a destruction of the temple, but the ninth of Av, for example, in the 1200s and in what, the 1400s, when they had to flee the, the nation that they were in, it was also the ninth of Av. So it doesn't mean it has to be an event where the temple is being destroyed, but it's an event that is historic that something will point to it again this year. So here we have the second month, 17th day. And on the Hebrew calendar, the fourth month, 17th day, is Tammuz and the breaching of walls. But you will have heard me teach on this many times over the years. And that is that you rarely hear me talking on this in the connection here with 40 days and 40 nights. Because for me, I personally believe that this connection right here is not the connection for us pre-trip. This connection, this conversation here is the Matthew 24 days of Noah, not the Luke 17. Okay? I don't expect the fountains of the great deep and, and, the, and the earthquakes and all that stuff to begin on the 17th of Tammuz. I believe this is specifically speaking about what we know the final year at the end of tribulation will be when the Lord returns feet down and it's the final year as it was in the days of Noah, as Matthew 24 talks about, which is the, the typology of the year event that the story of Noah and the ark took place. But we know that there are two stories built into the revelation of Genesis chapter 7 into 8. 
And the one that we always point to is 16, 17 of Genesis 7. And they went in male and female, and the Lord shut them in, and the flood was 40 days. You see, one is 40 days, the other says 40 days and 40 nights. Why? Why? Why didn't, why didn't you just save breath in writing and just say 40 days up here? Or why didn't you just add 40 days and 40 nights over here as well? The revelation is something that we've known about and we've shared for a few years now. And I remember when I was looking at it years ago and I was scratching my head because I knew there was two storylines built into it that was prophetic for the end of days. And the simple one is the Matthew 24, after the Lord returns at the end of the tribulation, immediately after the tribulation of those days, you see him coming on the clouds. And then you have that final year, which will be as it was in the days of Noah. Now, that was one that we had understood for a long time. <clears throat> but there was also another one built into it, as you guys all know. And this one is the relation to the 40 days as the 40 days of the Son of Man. And for anybody that doesn't know, we've got videos everywhere on this as well. It relates to the 40 days of the Son of Man and when the 40 days, you see, not 40 days and 40 nights here, but 40 days. So we've got a, a typology of the Luke 17, Son of Man who comes for 40 days as it was in the days of Noah. When his 40 days are done, this is the raven coming. The raven is that, you know, whether it's Antichrist spirit, it's, it's when Syria is filled with that raven type spirit. The Ishmael, when he comes at what? Exactly like Second Chronicles 24 says, when he comes at the year's end. So what is it? To the Hebrews, it's a year's end. You go into the definition of the word and it means at the turn of the year. You see? So it's a year's end, yet it's also a turn of the year. Because there's a beginning of the year in Nisan, there's a beginning of the year in Tishri, but to the Jews, it's Tishri. To the Jews, it's Tishri. And so when is he coming at the year's end? He's coming at Elul 29, and he's bringing about destruction to Tishri 1, and it's all the connection to Judah's portion when, when they're removed from the land and the 14 years then begin. Okay? So you've got the raven. This, re this represents the three days. So you've got the seven-day wedding, you've got the 40 days of the Son of Man, and then Acts chapter 1, not many days hence, is the difference from when the Son of Man leaves to when the dove, the Holy Ghost, comes. That's the three days. Holy Ghost is coming. He'll be endued. When the raven comes and the Ishmael, uh, Syria, comes and just comes to destroy Jerusalem, they will surround them for an attack first. That surrounding for an attack is an event that will probably last for about three days before they attack. We've taught it from many different places. We've shown it in many places. And the dove will come on the 50th day, will anoint those chosen remnant bride workers. They will then go from Jerusalem, but they start in Jerusalem and they go out from Jerusalem, teaching and preaching and so forth. Then Jerusalem is attacked. You know, the right to Tishri 1 and the 14 years will have begun. Just like the video. That, that's what this video talks about. There's going to be a short Middle East attack that happens at the beginning of the 50 days. And at the end of the 50 days, he doesn't say 50 days, but there's a short attack in Israel. That's the one that talks about, which is Iran and some of the others. And then it'll be World War III. World War III will begin. World War III will begin with uh, is, uh, Jerusalem being destroyed and the Jews fleeing after these guys have been anointed with the Holy Ghost. And we've showed how then it's what? Stayed yet seven other days, right? Then you've got the plucked off. This is the rapture group of the great multitude. Stayed yet seven other days. And then it's the 600th and first year and so forth, right? First year, first month, right? It's the beginning of the year. What is it? 14 years, seven days and seven days. Days as years. So we know that this and the relation as we've taught on over the years of the 40 days is the relation to the Son of Man coming at the beginning. But in Genesis chapter 7, when I've talked on this in the past in relation to the 40 days and 40 nights and in the 600th year as the 6,000th year, I believe 
that this isn't related to pre-trib, but is part of the story of post. Okay, so in seeing this, the second month, 17th day, in the end of days, at the end of 14 years, it could really literally still be the 17th day of Tammuz. Because to the Lord God, the beginning is in Taurus. So in Gemini, which is the Hebrew calendar Tammuz, it would still be the 17th day of the second month. Yet to, um, to uh, uh, um, yes, the 17th day of the second month, but to the end of days in that final year could be the breaching of the walls because the temple was rebuilt, you see? It could be the time of the breaching and the events happening and so forth. And it would still be on the 17th of Tammuz, which would be still directly correlated to as it was in the beginning with Genesis, it being the second day, uh, uh, second month, 17th day. So, as I said, the reason I bring it up is only to say, not that it's going to happen for sure. There's no thus saith the Lord in anything. It's just revelation, seeking and searching it out and realizing that with all of these other connections that land on the days revealed from Scripture, perfectly when counted from Taurus, we've got another one here, and it's co connected to a direct wording that we have in Genesis chapter 7. So I'm looking at it as let's keep our eyes open and not that we want Israel to be destroyed, but we know it's coming, right? So we, that's why we've got to pray for the Jews. We're living in their portion of time. We're living in their flesh period of time. So we need to be praying for them, right? They've been blinded for our sakes. And our sakes is done at the end of seals. Then it will revert back to their time. That's why the temple rebuilt and everything else, right? So. I'm not hoping for this. I'm not hoping for Israel to be attacked on the beginning of the 50 days at the escape. I'm not hoping them for them to be uh, destroyed in Jerusalem and, and have to flee and be gone for seven years. But I know it's going to happen. So that's why they're a part of my prayers every night. I pray the Luke, our father, because the Luke, our father, is for us. The Matthew, our father, is for Judah is for the Jews. So the one we pray, the one I pray, is the one from Luke. But when you pray that one, you need to remember to still pray for the Jews. If you're not aware of these differences in the Gospels, and you've been praying the Matthew one like the whole world does, that's the Lord, because they're praying from Matthew is because they don't know any different, because they don't know the differences in the Gospels. So by praying the Matthew one, because everything they've been taught is from the viewpoint of Judah, they're praying for the Jews and they don't even know it. It's beautiful to see and to have understanding how the word, how the Lord let that play out. Because most people don't pray for the Jews. They would say they know they should, but they don't. So because we know what we know, I purposely have the Jews in my prayers every day. I know these events are going to happen to them. I know they're about to be removed from the land for seven years. We know this. So that's why we pray for them. And so in knowing there's also a fast of the fourth connected to the fifth, seventh, and then one for the tenth, I think with everything else that's connected, I think this is worth keeping our eyes on. All right? If nothing happens, it's okay. We know what we're looking for, right? This is the period of time we're looking for. I believe the Lord will inform his remnant worker brides, as he says in Luke chapter 12, be ready when he returns from the wedding. The escape happens. The seven-day wedding takes place. The Lord returns about two months after his birthday, as we've recently shared, which is directly connected to Isaiah 9. And that's when he comes back about an eighth day and he begins his 40 days. When his 40 days are done somewhere around here, you have three days. The Holy Ghost anointing at the end of 50 and Syria will come and destroy Jerusalem and they'll be removed from the land for the next seven years. Within that period of time of the, those first seven years, 
they will have a remnant group brought back into the land and a rebuilding will take place, but only the foundation will get laid. We've shown all this many times and we're going to talk about it just in passing as we get further in and talk about this part in relation to the Shemitahs. Here's another thing. We'll touch on this a little bit later as well, but I wanted you guys to see this. I hadn't come across this website before, and it's like the California Almond Council. It's awesome. Check this out. Okay? So, grown in California's ideal Mediterranean climate. So, it's like being in the land of Israel all throughout the Mediterranean. So, it's growing in the same type of climate. What do we know about the almonds? Okay? We know the almond tree. From November through January, there's like this dormancy period. We've often talked about the blossoming of the almond tree and connected it to the word watch, right? The only thing is, there ain't no almonds at the New Year of trees, at the time when the almond trees are blossoming. Okay? That's just the indication that spring is near. They blossom generally sometime in February, could be, or it could be late, uh, late January, but generally it's, it's mid-late February to early March. That is the blossoming time. You see, it even has it here, between mid-February and mid-March. This is what we would call the New Year of Trees in Israel, okay? One of the four New Years that Israel has. Then, you see, then they've got to get their leaves, then they've got to begin to grow. And when they grow, it goes from March to June. It goes from March to June. This is one we focused on so much, but there aren't even almonds on it yet. So what ends up happening? Now it's growing between March and June. And look at when it cracks open. What does that look like to you? Does that look like the definition of almond? Does this look like, a, like an eye socket, right? Or your eyelids? And your eye inside? Almonds mean to watch, right? To watch, to pay attention. Well, when does this happen? Ta-da! In July. In July, almond hulls split open, exposing the almond shell and allowing it, uh, sorry, and allowing it and the kernel inside to dry shortly before harvest hulls turn uh, a straw yellow in color and open completely so they start to open you see it's just like your eye right the little connections in there and then they drop to the ground when in july do you know when the harvest begins when is the harvest of the watchmen the those watching in the almond start well when you read about it it starts from early august into July, uh, sorry, into October. So from August through October, and you can go read about it in other places, it's early August, mechanical tree shakers come and they fall to the ground. And look what happens. Protected by their outer hulls and shells, the almonds dry naturally in the warm California sun for seven to 10 days. That sounds pretty interesting, doesn't it? July? July, you've got the, the watchmen, that remnant group after the escape happens. And here they are in July. The shells are cracking open. And then what happens? Shakers come like what? Like the earth is going to shake the events that's going to happen during the seventh to the eighth day. And almonds are shaken and they fall to the ground and they're there for seven to ten days. And what happens? Seven to ten days. And the Lord returns on the eighth day at the beginning of August? At what? The beginning of August? And there's a period of seven to ten days? And the Lord comes back after a shaking? I had never noticed this before. I don't know how I had never seen this website before. It's from the California Almonds Council. And it's, it's all there. I just thought I'd share that. I think that's awesome because, you see, we've shared on this before. From Jeremiah. You see, remember this connection that it's saying. So this happens in July. We're looking for those that what? Those who are watching. Watching, which relates to the almond. Not to the almond bud, but to the almond. 
When does the almond open and look like an eye? In July. In later July and into August, it's shaken. And seven to ten days, it's on the ground after having been shaken during events that will take place. Look at, look at the timing, okay? Remember this timing. Here's the period of the eyes, right? The almonds, they've opened. The watching, the event of watching happens. And then what do we read in Jeremiah? So he comes to Jeremiah, and in Jeremiah 1, verse 11, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11. We shared on this in the past, right? But what we've always done, what I've always done, is we were always looking at this in relation to the connection at the time of the New Year of Trees. Right, We found this count in these connections that would lead us to this New Year of Trees count. Okay, Until we've got more detailed, more detailed, more focused, and realize that what we're looking for is a connection that starts in Taurus. 100% the count begins in Taurus. If it's not this year and this time comes and goes, next year. If not next, then the next year. It 100%, the count will begin in Taurus. And look at what the word for almond tree is, okay? Almond tree, okay? The almond, not the blossom. So it's, it is the earliest to bloom, which is the relation to the new year of trees, but it's about the almond. What does the almond mean? You guys all know it. To be alert, sleepless, be on the lookout, hasten, wake, watch. What are we told about this in the discourses? It's only mentioned in Luke and in Mark. Maybe because there's going to be a connection to the timing in both, one at towards the end of the sixth year of seals. Listen to what it says in Luke's. Everybody knows this one. It's our favorite one to go to. And yeah, we'll just start right where it is in Luke 21, 36. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. To what? To escape all these things that shall come to pass. All what things? Luke's discourse. Luke's discourse. Those who will be accounted worthy to escape all these things were what? Those who were watching. Those who were praying. Those who were as, as Enoch in Hebrews 11, who were diligently seeking the Lord. What is diligently seeking? Do you have to know everything we know at Ministry Revealed? That all these revelations? No. You just have to be spending time with the Lord on a daily basis. Get into his word. Don't allow yourself to be fed by others without going in to see if these things are understood for yourself. To see if you can dig in. Pray. Watch diligently seek and, and within your seeking ask the lord ask the spirit to reveal these understandings to you people don't have to know what we know to be accounted worthy to escape they have to be of course in christ right spirit filled loving watching praying and diligently seeking well here's the hebrew word for almond to be alert awake watching well let's see what it is in the Greek, to be sleepless, to keep awake, to watch. Was it, about, was it about the blossom of the almond? No, it was about the almond itself. And when is the almond ready? When does the almond ready when it's watching? In July, the hull splits open, and there's your harvest. Well, It'll already be ready, and then the shakers come. You see? Because there are two portions. Remember that, guys? What's, what's happening here in the ministry? I believe there's a preparation, as many of you guys already know, and believe even for yourselves. Doesn't mean everybody, right? Many are being prepared as the bride of Christ to go into the third heaven, to go into the lowest room. And there's another group within the ministry that we believe is being prepared which is why we've been given the understanding of the revelation of the end, 
and we're being prepared for when the Lord returns from the wedding, for which he will open up the rest of the revelation to them. He will open up their understanding. They will follow him for 40 days. They will receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost on the 50 days, and they will remain as new apostles are also there remaining, and they will be the seals workers. Okay? To be that group, you have to be a part of those who are watching. Look at this as a side note. Look at what it says about this. In Luke 21, 36, it says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. This word accounted worthy is used four times, but not really. Two times it's used as count worthy. That's for Matthew. And two times it's accounted worthy. So here's the one in Luke for the accounted worthy, which is the pre-trib, okay? They won't experience any of these things. They won't experience death. Those that are alive in Christ, outside of the remnant worker, they will be taken alive, not tasting of death. Where do we get the revelation of it? I think it's in Luke chapter 20. In Luke chapter 20, it's the resurrection, right? The woman that had seven husbands that died. You know, who's she going to be married to? And in Luke 21, 35, it says, But they which shall be accounted worthy. So remember, the accounted worthy has a pre-trib group that goes to the third heaven and has a portion that remains here as his remnant worker. And look at what it says about these accounted worthy. To obtain that world. So, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. That's the pre-trib group comma, and the resurrection from the dead. This is the other group, right? For those that haven't been around for a while, this is the two, these are the two groups. Who are the ones that take part in the resurrection of the dead? It's the remnant workers who will put their necks on the line during the time of seals. It says they're the ones for Smyrna who will not be hurt by the second death they're the ones resurrected at the end of tribulation when the Lord returns. They take part in the resurrection of ruling and reigning with them for a thousand years. They're the only group outside of those that were promised from the Old Testament, right? For the Jews' time, those that were promised the millennial reign. This is the group. There's those that are going pre-trib, not having tasted of death, that were accounted worthy, who were watching and praying, as Luke 21 said, and the other portion are those who are being prepared, who will be putting their necks on the line. Doesn't mean every one of them will die, but they put their necks on the line and they're part of the resurrection of the dead who will rule and reign with them for a thousand years. That's the Smyrna group. That's the Luke 24 group of which we've shared on many times. So I really wanted to share this connection with almonds as well, because here it is again, something we've, we've been looking for, we've been understanding and discerning for a while. And what we're not looking for is the blossoming, but the almond. And guess what? July. July. And then what? August. There's the open. There's a shaking. You see, what is this shaking? Something we've taught on many times as well, right? This shaking is the Psalms 18. Isn't that awesome? Psalms 18, Psalms 118, and the chapters to years, right? It's literally the events. It's the, it's the stone's throw, the foundations of the earth being seen. Craziness is going to happen during those seven to the eighth day. See, like a shaking. While the almond trees are what? Drying up, right? Or while the almonds are preparing and being ready. Perfect timing. You see what I'm saying in all of this? You see what all of this beginning stuff is talking about? It all equals account from going in the beginning, just as Thomas said in the Gospel of Thomas in the Apocryphal book. When the Lord answered and said, whoever finds the beginning finds the end, for in the beginning there is the end, and whoever finds it will not taste of death. Fascinating stuff. Awesome, awesome stuff. All of it, guys. All of it connected to this period of time when we count from Taurus. So exciting.
Now let's get into some of the other stuff. Let's keep going. This will tie in the 70. We'll talk about something else in this as well. This is the chart that we've been talking about that I said I would do a video on. And it's the, the Sabbath year counts or the, the Shemitah years. All right. In the Shemitah years, let's go, for example, uh, let's go to Leviticus chapter 25. And you see it in Leviticus chapter 5, right? The Sabbath year. So let's see, uh, da, 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 seventh year shall be a Sabbath, okay? Intermission year, there we Sabbath year, Shemitahs, right, is another thing that they call it. The seventh year is the year of rest. After the 49, the seven times seven years, then you have the final Jubilee. We've been able to show in how this all happened and how this came about was We've known now for several years that there is two sets of seven. We've known for, you know, five and a half years now, for a little, about five and a half years. We've known that the truth is 14 years. We knew that it was seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. So if we knew there was a seven and a seven, we also knew that there was one final year, which is the Jubilee year. Okay, so what is that a picture of? It's the two, it's the last two Sabbaths, the seventh and the seventh, and then what? The end of it is the Jubilee. So if the end of it is the Jubilee, then what do you have for a count? It's the seven times seven. And in the seven times seven, it really started over here. There was seven easy years like Jacob, then he got Leah, right? which represents the, the old wheat, the winter wheat that goes first. Then you have the seven years of seals. And then you have the final seven years of trumpets. And what is the total picture? It's 22 years, right? When you start down here, it's the picture of 22 years. Seven, 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 and one. 22 is the big picture. How many letters in the Hebrew alphabet? 22 letters. We revealed in, in that awesome video about the it's all a fractal or it's a fractal is the revelation of creation is the total story will be 22,000 years, right? The, the final millennial reign will be the 21,000th year. And then the 22nd will be the new beginning. You see, well, how does it play out? Well, consider this. This is like, the seven days of unleavened bread. Okay, there's three feasts to the Lord. The first one is the Feast of Weeks, which, let me reinstate, let me restate this, that when we count from in the beginning, this is the seventh Sabbath, and this is the beginning of the 50 days. So, to the Lord God, Seven Sabbaths, then shall you number 50 days, right? Seven Sabbaths and a new meat offering. It just so happens that in the reality of life, this is the time when the winter wheat harvest is done and the, the two wave loaves are actually brought in. You see, is this really the one? Yes. Yes, it really is the one. And so what are we seeing? There are three feasts to the Lord. One is a single day at the seventh Sabbath, right at the end of the seventh Sabbath. Then you have seven days with the bread of affliction. And then you've got what? Seven days of tabernacles. And when the seven days of tabernacles, you have what? The eighth day. And the eighth day is called what? New beginning. It is the revelation of the end of days, and it's pre, mid, post, and the final jubilee, the new beginning. You see? So it plays out in years, and it plays out in the big picture of creations over thousands of years. And how does it start? Seventy years from when they come into the land, and seventy years from when Jerusalem is finished, her 70, okay? 
So let's have a look at this. How, how did this chart even come about? How did this come about? And that was what I was saying a moment ago. I knew that there were seven years and seven years. I knew that there were 14 years that remained and that the final one was the final Jubilee at the end of six, for 6,000 years, okay? So in knowing this, I said, well, what if we counted back Sabbath years all the way back to Christ? And when I did this and went all the way back to Christ, because not only did we know the final two, we actually knew the final three. So what I wanted to know is if we could find something in the final one before the last two take place. So in the third last Sabbath, can we find something as a clue in it? And I did it in my head. It was funny. I, I did it in my head. I can generally be pretty good with numbers. And I did it in my head and I was charting this all out, made sure on my calculator, contacted our brother Ivan, who's uh, our brother from South Africa and is great with charts and graphs and all this stuff, man. He's awesome. I appreciate it. And he went and did it and he's like, yeah, it's 289. You were right. And so what happened is it brought us all the way back. So we did all the sevens and we just don't show them all here and go all the way back to the birth of Christ. But what happened was at first we thought it was here. Maybe it was connected to here. There was still a little bit of confusion. However, it landed that it would be at the time of the birth of Christ, when the first Sabbath, when we count from that first Sabbath and we did the count, it brought us to where the 70th year of Israel from when they came into the land was the 289th sabbath year now why was that important because in luke chapter 13 in luke chapter 13 we have jesus with the parable of the barren fig tree so it's the parable of the fig tree it starts in uh in verse 6 of luke 13 it says he spake also this parable a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. So you got three years, right? And I don't find anything. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig it about and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Okay, so we had this count of three years and then given it one more year. But what does this do in relation to the Shemitah year counts? Well, here's the, remember 289? So what was interesting is when I did the count and I realized the number of Sabbath years from Christ to when the 70th year would end, when I realized that it was 289, my very first thought was to check out the definition of the word 289. And the Greek word 289 answered my question because it was only used once in the Greek. And the story where it was used was about three years and then give it one more year and let's see. So when we had done this and looked at it and we'd been talking on it, talking on it, but what had happened is it wasn't the end of the story. Because at that point, we didn't know if it was supposed to be here or if it was somewhere down here. We didn't fully yet have this understanding of where truly can we nail down where Jesus' birthday was. There were some opinions. Was it really at Hanukkah time or was it really at the time around the Feast of Weeks in the third month? Where, where did this all fall what was the real proof on either side? And it was finally understood, like our brother Ivan had been determined that it was the Feast of Weeks for a long time, but I still was wavering between the two until we had seen enough evidence. And one of them, which we're going to talk about, is the star of Bethlehem and, and a lawyer and what happened to him. And he started touring the world. Uh, we recently, when we shared on this, I was showing how a... Um, uh, uh, a terrarium, not a terrarium, um, 
Oh shoot, what is it? Where you go to look at the stars, right? In a in a in like a museum, whatever it is. I forget the name. I don't know. I always have a, a mental block when I'm thinking on that word. But they went in the planetarium. There you go. And in the planetarium, it was an atheist and an atheist that was running it, an atheist that was showing the the events and things like that. And he decided to do the Star of Bethlehem. It was agreed on. And as he did it, this guy ended up becoming a Christian because he saw it all laid out in the stars because obviously he went to go see what the Bible said about it, what history wrote about it, and he was showing it in the stars. And he said, oh my goodness, it's true. And the guy became a Christian. Well, when he was showing it at first, he didn't become a Christian, right? It took him a little while, but he ended up becoming a Christian. And he showed that Jesus was in fact born in the third month on um what was it on Jul june 17th i think it was june 17th now if you use a gregorian count they don't use a year zero right with a gregorian with a with a calendar count they don't say zero so you would have to see that it was in 2 bc if you use a zero which you should just like stellarium do you use 1000 did you count the year 2000 of course, there was a year zero. And in the year zero, we've done all these teachings on it to show that if absolutely it's true. We see that when we count from Jesus' birth at the Feast of Weeks of 1 BC, and he turned one in the, or sorry, he completed his first year in zero, okay, in the year zero at the Feast of Weeks, and then from the Feast of Weeks in year zero to the Feast of Weeks of one is when he turned two. So what did we have? It started in a Sabbath year, and we're gonna talk about this. But what it had done is it led me to the 289, <clears throat> and when we didn't yet know precisely, and I wasn't yet fully convinced as to where it was, we didn't have, there, there was still flaws in trying to put this count and understanding together, okay? And as we were teaching on this, what became so important for us was when Israel became a nation, which was in 1948. So when we counted 1948 and you would do four years, we would say, oh, 1948 to 49, 49 to 50, 50 to 51, ah, <coughs> 51 to 52. That's the end of the four years. So then what ended up happening? Well, then you could easily say right here, this is what we're looking at. So what were we looking at in 2022? In 2022, from 1952 to 2022 would have been the 70 years. You see? But when you put the count back from when Christ was born, and if you backed it up one or two more years, then we wouldn't have been looking for a count starting in 22. We would have been looking at an account from 20, uh, 1951 to 2021. And if it was a year back from there, then you could have also believed from 1950 to 2020. You see what I'm saying? And this is why we've been searching it out and seeking it out, because we now had proof from Scripture in account of Sabbaths that led us to Luke 13, that revealed the vine dresser, the worker of the right, who was the vine dresser, told us of a count that was three years and then give it one more year. But the problem was, I didn't yet have the count of Christ's birth in the right place. And then what ended up happening was one of our brothers, I believe his name is Samuel had sent me a message and said, I found another count in relation to three years and then the fourth year. And I said, what? He showed it in Leviticus chapter 19. And this is one that we had been hanging our hat on for a long time here in this ministry, but <laughs> we, we could I could never allow myself to, to fully see the very end of it because the way it was worded there was little mysteries little nuances hidden in it 
So in Leviticus 19, 23 through 25, it says, and when you shall come into the land, okay? Number one, when you come into the land, when did they come into the land? They came into the land in 1948, okay? So they came into the land in 1948, and it says, when you come into the land, and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then shall you count the fruit, you see, kind of like, right? Kind of like uh, Luke 21, I mean, uh, Luke 13. Then shall you count the fruit thereof uncircumcised. Well, do you realize what's happening, right? And shall have planted all manner of trees for food. Then shall you count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised. Three years it shall be uncircumcised unto you, and you shall not eat of it. And then what, this is what I would do. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord. So what would we see? A celebration of thanksgiving for harvest. Okay? A celebration for thanksgiving for harvest. Look, to give in marriage, clear shine. So we, I would look at this and I would say, see, fourth year, bang. And so we were looking from 2021 into 2022. And we thought, this has got to be it. This has got to be it. And I remember our sister, who's now gone to be with the Lord here earlier this year, Maxine, who was up in Edmonton, and she had emailed me and she's like, but I'm not so sure that it should be in the fourth year. And this was early when we were talking about it. She says, because in the fifth year, it says that it's theirs. And, you know, yeah, I know it says that, but it also says in the fourth year is when you would bring it to the Lord. So what was the issue I was having back then? I wasn't counting this as being at the beginning of the count of 70 years. I was looking at it as the count from Luke 13 that made it sound that if 70 was down here or whatever it was in 2018, 19, then one, two, three years, and in the fourth year, it's to the Lord. So we were looking at this time. But the revelation in Leviticus 19 was not showing us that it was something being added to the end. It was showing us that it was something from what? When you come into the land. All right? <clears throat> so we're going to go into this so you guys can completely see it, you completely understand it, and we're going to take it right up through to the end of Revelation. <clears throat> so let's prove this out right here, okay? 1 BC, and it was at the time of the Feast of Weeks, all right? Let's start watching this for a few minutes here and uh, listen to what he says. We've shown it from another point before. But now we're going to show it from this one. This is a great one. This is where I first really started to learn about it. But then a few years had passed and it was kind of put aside. And then we found that one with the guy with the planetarium. Well, now listen to this. This guy was a lawyer, started looking into it. You can watch the video for yourself. And the first few minutes he talks about how it came about, what happened. And then he was asked to start touring and visiting all these places and starting to share on the Star of Bethlehem. So you would think, right, you would think with all of this understanding and all the revelation, everything connected, showing that Jesus was actually born in, um, in June, on the 17th of June, which back then is the, sev uh, uh, the 15th day of the third month, you would think that the church would have changed, right? Well, of course not. Of course not. Who are the ones that come to understand these things, guys? Those who diligently seek. You see, those who diligently seek, just like we do here, and in all the revelations that we received, we want to do what this guy's doing. We want to go and do presentations and share it with everybody around the world. But it's not easy to accept because the whole world says, Jesus wasn't born in, in, at the Feast of Weeks. Jesus was born at Christmas. Why? Because the church told me so. Right? Oh, the tribulation isn't 14 years because the whole church in the world told me it was seven. 
What do you mean who the Gospels are speaking to? There's no such thing as who the Gospels are speaking to. We all learn from Matthew. <laughs> you see, it's not an easy thing. But there are those who diligently seek. And when we diligently seek and when others are diligently seeking, they come across these things, right? And they start to realize it. <laughs> What's funny with most of them, though, is they still observe Christmas as Jesus' birthday. You see, the, you see the contradiction happening there? But you'll see that this indeed is Jesus' birthday, and it's proven out in the sun, moon, and stars. Or system works. You hear Copernicus, he, Copernicus figured out that the, the sun was the center instead of the earth. The guy who figured out the actual math that drives the planets, that was Kepler, Johannes Kepler. And Kepler uh, puzzled out the three laws of planetary motion in the early 1600s. Now those laws hold today, they're math, and they're the same laws that NASA uses and the ESA uses to, uh, to predict where planets will be. When they launch a rocket and it has to travel for 13 years to get someplace, they know where the uh, celestial bodies will be because it's all like a great clock. It's extremely regular, it's mathematically precise. Kepler discovered that in the 1600s. Before that, we couldn't calculate what the skies looked like in past times. But with Kepler's discovery, we can. Kepler discovered the math, but he did have a problem. I mean, uh, math is, uh, was laborious back then. It was done in your head or on paper. And you have to have a lot of calculations if you're trying to calculate the appearance of the night sky and all the stars in it. I mean, that's a lot of work. And the, the man used you know, a quill pen and some vellum, probably, and probably took a long time for him to draw a chart. And that would be accurate. His math was excellent. And he'd have an accurate picture, but it would be a snapshot. You know, and if he, if, he, if he calculated the appearance of the sky on the wrong day, or the wrong week, or the wrong hour for that matter, he might totally miss something very significant. But that all changed, you know, today. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we're hearing about the star now, because we've taken that math and put it into software. You can see the night sky uh, from any place on the surface of the Earth, at any time in history, in an instant. And it's so fast, you can animate the sky. Kepler was a religious guy, so the first thing he did, once he discovered these laws, first thing he did, he starts cranking those laws trying to find, what, the star of Bethlehem. He wrote two books on it, but Kepler missed the star. The reason he missed the star is he was looking in the skies at the wrong years. Here's the problem, Kepler had a mistaken understanding of first century history. He thought a very important man died on a certain date and he was just wrong. The very important man was King Herod, the same King Herod who tried to kill the baby Jesus. So obviously Herod was alive when Jesus was born, and Kepler believed that Herod died in 4 BC, and so he only looked in earlier years. He looked in 5 and 6 and 7 BC for the Star of Bethlehem. When you look in those years, you don't find much. He was taking his information from the writings of one Flavius Josephus. Josephus was a, a, a Jewish scholar. He wrote it about the same time that Jesus was on earth, and he wrote Jewish histories. And, and from the Josephus writings, it's possible to infer the date of Herod's death. I use that word infer because uh, he didn't use our dating system, our calendar system, so he couldn't just say 4 BC. But you can, you can infer the date of Herod's death from Josephus' writing. Kepler thought that inference should be 4 BC. But we have new knowledge. A man took an interest in this question of when Herod died. And this gentleman went and looked at manuscripts from Josephus. He looked at the, in the British Museum and our museums here in the United States, and he found that all the oldest manuscripts, every one that dates before 1544, all of them, are consistent with Herod having died in 1 BC. Uh, some kind of a printing or copying error or something crept in and, and propagated from there. And so, actually, if you have a copy of Josephus on your shelf right now, it's probably going to be a 4 BC copy because it propagated widely. But all the early manuscripts, you know, are consistent with Herod having died in 1. And that opens up the possibility for us to look in the years 2 and 3 BC for the star. There you go. So we're going we're gonna to cover other parts too. <clears throat> but you see what's important here is the same thing that happens with the church. Even some of these great teachers, some of these great pastors out there that we have, whether it's, uh, uh, I always think of uh, Jonathan Kahn in this that I watched years ago. They, they still think that the writings of Herod, because they're reading the, the modern manuscripts of it, instead of the original ones, they're thinking that he died in 4 BC, in 4 BC when the reality is that he died in 1 BC. And the evidence is literally in the original manuscripts, but is still perverted and distorted in all the ones that have been in circulation of more modern prints. Why? Probably for deception, probably to hide these things so that nobody can follow, nobody can understand, nobody can track seasons and times, nobody would be aware and ready for years. Nobody would understand the truth of Jesus' birth, right? The, the time of his birth. Nobody really understood how to follow and track the sun, moon, and stars until what? What was he talking about? Now we have it at our fingertips, right? And we've shared it and we use it often or regularly, which is we've got programs like Stellarium, 
We can go back thousands of years and track things back and see where the placements were of the sun, moon, and stars. And that's what this guy used. He started to go in and started tracking these things and understood that in the original manuscripts, that Herod's death was in 1 BC. The evidence was absolutely everywhere. And this is something that I had showed in like over the years as well. This is from hopeofisrael.org about understanding and following and tracking that Herod's death was really in 1 BC. And when you understand it's in 1 BC, like he did, when he went with what Kepler did, and Kepler, because Herod believed to have been uh, to have died in uh, 4 BC, from what he was reading, not having the original manuscripts, not going back, what ended up happening is he would start looking then back, if it was 4 BC, he would start looking at the signs back in 5, 6 BC. And that's what you hear from Jonathan Kahn and from pastors all over the place. It's, you know, you know what happens, and I've shared this just recently, because I heard a pastor talk about this, that when you come into Revelation and you come to understand something that you hadn't understood before, it's proven out, it's before you, and you are a pastor. You're a pastor of a church that has elders, that has, you know, the whole management team and everything else. And you come about with this understanding that brings much more clarity. And you want to start teaching it to the congregation. Do you know that pastors can't do that if they have a board, right? And they have their elders and everybody else. They will not allow them to do it. And there's a story I'd recently seen and brought in and mentioned in the past, in the recent past, where a pastor had heard about what Easter was about and got into it and was shared all this info and found all the detail and started digging in. And he thought, my goodness, this is incredible. And he went to his board and he was going to go teach it to his congregation. And his board wouldn't allow him to teach it. You see why? Because they've all got their boss, right? It all goes back to the head of the church. It all goes all the way back. And if you start mixing it up here, oh, the people will get confused because everybody else is teaching it like this. It's the watchmen. It's those who are watching and praying and diligently seeking who are the ones finding these things and putting these pieces together. And what does it cause people to do? Cause them to question their church. Why aren't you sharing this? Why won't you take the time to look into this? If you know this, why aren't you doing it? Why aren't you preparing the people? Why wouldn't you give them truth? And they'll just say, well, this is the way we've always done it. Or, you know, we don't want to go off in a different direction and cause confusion. Yeah, because he'd be fired. And that's what happened to the story with this one pastor. And he ended up becoming a janitor. You know, it's unfortunate. Hopefully he's still doing things for the Lord. But he went and became a janitor because he refused to, to keep putting out the lie. You see? But for those who are watching, for those who are praying, for those who are diligently seeking the Lord in love and in repentance, they're finding the truth. And they have been for, for years, for generations they have. But they're never the ones brought to the forefront everywhere. You see? Because then churches would have to start to wake up. <clears throat> Revelation would have to be taught. And it would crumble the church behind the scenes that produces all this stuff and the entire thing would change. Not obviously not salvation and all that, not the stories of, of, of the typologies of living your life and how it played out, not those things, but the events themselves, the specific events that so many people come to understand, they would all have to change. This is one of them. We know that the truth is Herod was 1 BC. And so when you realize this as he did, <clears throat> he knew that the reason Kepler couldn't find it was because it'd be impossible to find in 5 and 6 BC. Once you realized when Herod died and you could look in around 2 BC, guess what happens? Right? There. So now let's go see what happens when he starts digging into these things. Uh, 
even if they don't believe in Jesus or you know the Bible or anything, they're going to show you this at Christmas because all planetaria do Christmas shows. That's the only way they can get you in there, right? Um, and they always show this event because this event is simply so spectacular. Whether they believe in God or not, they're going to show you this, this shot. Um, I'm going to kind of cheat as I show it to you, though, because the, uh, observation back then was all naked eye observation. They had no lenses. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to zoom in because I want to show you guys. I'm going to take you in on the secret of what's happening here. And they couldn't zoom, but we can, so I'm going to zoom in way in. So finally, I get those two objects separated. One of them's Jupiter, the other one's another planet. You're gonna tell me which one, too. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. That's the mother planet. Venus is the mother planet. So we have Jupiter, the king planet, and Venus, the mother planet, coming into very close conjunction. That seems kind of pregnant, doesn't it? In fact, they got even closer than that. Let me wind time forward just a little bit. What I'm trying to show you is that they really stacked like a figure eight. So they didn't block each other's light, they added. What you had then was two stars stacked on top of each other, too close together to separate with the naked eye. And so to an observer, it appeared to be the brightest star anyone alive had ever seen. Um, you, we know the math, and so I can tell you that no one alive had ever seen a star that bright. That was it. I believe the star of Bethlehem was the brightest star. So we've seen the birth of the king in the sky. We've seen the brightest star. But now we have the issue of it being in the south. Remember when they were traveling from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, the star is said to have been before them, ahead of them. In the, so it would have to be in the southern sky. So let's go back to the sky, see if Jupiter did that. They've now traveled to Jerusalem. It's November, I've given them some time for travel. This is south, remember uh, Bethlehem is due south from Jerusalem. And then seven in the morning, sure enough, there in the sky, in the southern sky, is Jupiter, or the little town of Bethlehem. Now the hard part though, can a star stop? How can a star stop? So that was a puzzler. Because we all know stars can't stop. I mean, physics and inertia prevent that. So I puzzled all that hard, I worried about that one, until I realized I had the problem upside down. I had it backwards. The problem is not that stars can't stop. The problem is that all stars are always stopped. I mean, they move like the hour hand on your watch. You can't see it. You know it's moving, but you can't see it move. Well, if the problem is that stars are always stopped, what can Matthew have meant by saying the star stopped? And I thought retrograde motion, because of course stars do stop, planets do, in, in their movement through the field of fixed stars. They stop, they even reverse course. And that's how I think retrograde motion explains what the star stopping was. So did Jupiter do that? Let's have a look. I'll animate Jupiter and let it drop a tail. And there you see it, sure enough, Jupiter comes to a full stop and reverses course over the little town of Bethlehem. But I want to show you another screen that's more fun because I can throw dates with it. Now what I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to let Jupiter fly through the field of fixed stars and it's going to throw off dates so we can tell when these events are happening. The first one there, I know it's small, I'll read it for you. It says 1030 of 2 BC. Now let's fly Jupiter. You see it moving through the fixed stars. There's, that says 1125 of 2 BC and it's slowing up. It's going to stop right about here, reverse course. The date when it stopped over the little town of Bethlehem 1225 of 2 BC. Does that date sound familiar? Well, Mr. Larson, you mean they, they went down there on Christmas? Well, it turns out that's true. Um, am I saying that Jesus was born on 1225? No, I'm not saying that at all. Absolutely. In fact, I don't think anyone thinks that. No, I, what I'm saying is that that is quite literally, quite possibly the date of the first Christmas. Did it have any meaning to them? No, it had no meaning. The date had no meaning to them because they didn't use our calendar system. I mean, but it does have meaning to us. It could well be assigned to us. Um, let me give it you see, so what's happened here, <clears throat> is when they saw that star over Bethlehem, it was 1225. It wasn't when Jesus, uh, from when the uh, conception took place, it wasn't the birth, it wasn't any of that. It was when they saw that star, that retrograde taking place. Let me give you the chronology now. In September of 3 BC, Jupiter crowns Regulus in Leo, uprising. Okay. In September of 3 BC, this was the, the time when they, when they recognize this, when what? Conception takes place. It's Virgo, clothed in the sun, new moon, birth at her feet, Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year. Nine months later, the biggest planet goes together with the brightest planet to make the brightest star anyone alive had ever seen. Where? Right over Jerusalem as it sets. The Magi ride. They get there uh, sometime around November. They go to Herod and they say, we've seen the star, where's the baby king? Uh, Herod says, uh, Bethlehem. So they're leaving uh, the gates of Jerusalem to go to Bethlehem, five mile track. Uh, and they look up and there's the star, there's Jupiter, right over this little town of Bethlehem. One of the guys who's the guy who does the math for the group, he's going, wait, 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 wait. It's in full retrograde, it stopped right over the little town of Bethlehem. They ride down to Bethlehem on 1225, 2 BC, we know that's the date, because that's when the star stopped. They're carrying gifts, remember? Frankincense, gold, and myrrh. They find the baby boy. Is he uh, living in a manger? No, 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 he's moved, he's in, a, he's in a house now. He's described in Greek as a pideon, he's a toddler. They find the baby boy and they present these fabulous gifts to him on what turns out to be the first Christmas, 1225 of 2 BC. And now I've shared. See, now we have to remember 
is what we've talked about over here. He's including the non-year zero. You have to remember that, all right? So in the non-year zero, then his birth would have been in 2 BC. So please remember that. But we need to include a year zero. That's the difference. So now let's go a little bit further. Okay, so what we end up seeing here, we're going to hear him then talk about things in relation to constellations, the meaning when he goes into Job. So let's go to this briefly. Weirdest things start happening. Something like a sound of rushing wind happens in the room where they are. Something like fire dances over their heads. And suddenly the disciples begin to speak in foreign language. Okay. So what we, what we just first saw was in relation to the birth of Christ. Jesus was born on the 15th day of the third month. His birth was on... Um, it was, what was it? Um, we showed it even on the chart before. It was June 17th, the 15th day of the third month, back in 1 BC. So when you understand this, it was the conception taking place at the time frame of uh, September, right? At the time of Rosh Hashanah and the birth about nine months later. And it was all connected to the 15th day of the third month. So now, from there, he's going to start taking us into, where am I here? From there, he's now going to take us to the next place that we're looking at. So when we count this from Jesus's birth, and we start coming into this period of time of these things here, okay? I want you guys just to be able to see these things that are spoken about. Which is other tongues. People who are in town for the Pentecost feast hear the commotion, crowd starts to gather, and these out-of-towners are hearing their own languages being spoke, spoken by a bunch of Galilean fishermen. It gets crazy. Some, the crowd gets big enough that there are hecklers in the back, and one of the hecklers shouts out, says, Oh, they're just drunk! Peter stands up and says, They're not drunk, it's only nine in the morning! Now, I, I lecture to a lot of college students, and I'm wondering, this is persuasive? You know. So, he, the next thing he does, don't try on, on your own. You know, what he does next is crazy. He's got a huge crowd, and it's kind of an unruly crowd. He's got hecklers and stuff. And so Peter stands up, and he starts quoting an ancient prophet. This is what he says. He quotes Joel. And he says, I will show wonders in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below. Blood, and there's been a crucifixion. Fire, something like fire danced over the disciples' heads. And billows of smoke, and the sun will be turned to darkness. I think Joel saw a vision of something like smoke that blotted out the sun. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood. The moon turned to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he shouts at him. He says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. Now let me tell you why I put italics there. That's a, that's a very interesting argument. Let me paraphrase what just happened. Got a rowdy crowd out here. Peter stands up and he says basically this. Joel predicted a bunch of stuff and you've seen it. Now, you don't make that argument, especially to a rowdy crowd, unless they've seen the stuff. And one of the things they are said to have seen was a blood moon. Y'all know what a blood moon is? I thought that was weird. I thought that was just weird prophet talk. <laughs> you know, I don't know. You, have you ever read and you see something in scripture and it just it strikes you so strange, like the moon will be turned to blood. And you say, oh, okay. You know, it just sounds like prophet talk and I didn't know what it meant, but it turned out I was very wrong. That's a technical term. It's an ancient technical term and it has a specific meaning. It means a lunar eclipse. Why do they call those blood moons? Because when the moon goes into eclipse, it goes into Earth's shadow. And so it gets no direct illumination from the sun. Instead, the only light that hits the moon under those conditions is refracted through the Earth's atmosphere. It's red shifted. Same thing, the similar phenomenon makes our sunsets red sometimes. So when the light comes through our atmosphere and it's red shifted, it illuminates the moon, which becomes a dull red color. Have you ever seen one of those? Yeah, pretty spectacular, aren't they? It can be. Well, um, here's the just, just what we've just seen. Peter says that Joel said that there's a blood moon and you've seen it. So there was an eclipse. Interesting. Now we need to date Christ's execution. The, the, the reason we have to do that is otherwise we won't know what to look at the sky. We, we need to know what day we should study the sky to see the, the end of this poem that I'm showing you. So we have clues. Um, incidentally, let me make another, make another pitch for my website here, BethlehemStar.net. The reason I'm pitching it again right here, there's a whole lot of really fascinating stuff on the website about this issue, the dating of Christ's execution. First, we know it was preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. Okay, some of you may not know what preparation day means. Jews of this time, if they were observant Jews, could not work on the Sabbath, which was Saturday. They couldn't cook, couldn't wash clothes. So if they wanted to eat, they had to prepare it on Friday. And so Friday came to be called Preparation Day. So all four Gospels say that Jesus was killed on a Friday. 
Next clue. It was just before the Passover feast. Now, that's super useful because we know when Passover is. We find from Leviticus, the Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. That's the Jewish lunar month of Nisan. The, the Jewish calendar is not a solar calendar like the one we use. So those three clues taken together are extremely powerful. And let me explain why. Because um, their lunar calendar works like our solar calendar in some ways, and this is one of them. Think about your birthday. It's always on the same day of the month, right? Is it always on the same day of the week? No, because in the solar calendar and the lunar calendar, days of the month can float through the days of the week. Our calendars are alike in that. But that's a clue. It's a huge clue. Because now you can see Jesus must have been killed in a year when Nisan 14 happened to fall on a Friday. Can you see that? Okay, that really narrows things down. Let's get some more clues up there. Jesus himself is about 30 years old when he began his ministry. John recounts three Passovers during Christ's ministry. And we know he was taken before Pilate. And we know when Pilate sat because Tacitus, the Roman historian, records it, 26 to 36 AD. So all these things taken together, plus more stuff on the website, come to one conclusion. Only April 3 of 33 AD seems to fit all the lines of evidence. This is the- All right, there we saw it right there. And again, this is something <clears throat> that we've taught again recently, but again, we're going through this whole timeline of this. So we know that in fact, Jesus did his death and resurrection occurred at Passover time of 33 AD. But you see what the issue is? Even if you took that guy's timing to go back here and right, because they have no year zero, so they push it back a year. Do you know what happens? Jesus in 33 AD, when they put the timing of 33 AD, how on earth do they connect it to Luke chapter 3? You see? So even within the evidence that he, that he has, that he's able to go and show these things with the blood moons, with the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the movement, as the, as the planetariums have been able to do and go and show all these things, showing that the truth was truly at the time of Feast of Weeks in the 15th day of the third month at Christ's birth. And to do this count and to do this calculation, to end up in 33 AD, how on earth can they do it in account from reading Luke chapter 3? You see, in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, and then we come to this piece of scripture that we've recently revealed. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. We see, why is this so important to us? Why does this make a difference? Well, in fact, the guy himself even spoke about it. He even mentioned Luke chapter 3, and Jesus began to be about 30 years of age. What, what is the purpose of that revelation? Everybody on earth thinks that it means Jesus himself turned 30. You see, this was, <clears throat> excuse me, this was another glitch that still remained in this count. Once we got this, and we finally, I finally had come to understand <clears throat> that there is truly a year zero when you use the sun, moon, and stars, that it was the time of his birth, that it was the third month, 15th day, when all of this was revealed and understood. And we did this count to bring us to the revelation, which is fixed in the sun, moon, and stars, proving it was Passover in 33 AD at his death and resurrection. Then there was an issue. There remained an issue because there was actually four and a half years or approximately four and a half years, but it, it, it wasn't jiving. Because guess what? If you say, well, it's when Jesus turns the actual number 30, like his birthday. So when you physically turn the number 30 and you go out for a celebration because you turn 30, the problem was we knew that there was one year where Jesus and John were still here on the earth together, even though John was in prison for most of that time, before Jesus took over on his own solely, which equaled 
the about three and a half years. We knew this from the revelation of the end of days. You see, you guys will all remember this, right? It all was revealed through the revelation of the end of days. Because when we get to the sixth year, we know it, we have proven it, we have revealed it through the revelation that in, well, let me just go to this, that the end of the sixth year of seals, remember it's six years, seven Sabbath, six years, seven Sabbath, you see, it is six years of seals. And within the six years of seals, you have the six seals taking place. Doesn't mean it's one by year, one by year, one by year. But by the end of the sixth seal, six years will have taken place. And what do we see at the end of the sixth year? Everybody freaking out, you know, rocks uh, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. All right? Who shall be able to stand? This is the point that we know when he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. When he is that, that rock carved without hand that comes and destroys the feet of the image of the Nebuchadnezzar image, which is the, the, the Nimrod image, if you will, which is the Tower of Babel imagery, which is the, 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 the end of seals, the destruction of the Antichrist. It is the Ezekiel 39 war, and they all come together. It is the second Ezra's when he comes and Mount Zion is made manifest and the world is freaking out, but even though they're freaked out, the armies that were fighting will come and gather themselves together to come and fight them. There will be destruction everywhere from it. They will be destroyed. And we know that it will be about seven months in burying them after the Ezekiel War, especially all around in the area of Jerusalem and so forth. You see, what's happening? It is the end of the sixth year of seals when they see this happening. So what's happening in the seventh year of seals? Well, from that destruction, then you got the 144,000 that get sealed. They're going to help the remnant bride workers that were there during seals that are still alive. Their 144,000 <coughs> are going to begin by helping bring in the great multitude rapture with the others. After the 144, that's why you then see the rapture of the great multitude. This is going to happen about the middle of the seventh year of seals. Then you go to Revelation chapter 8. You have the seventh seal, which is about the space of half an hour in heaven, which is a typology of saying about half a year. I believe it'll probably be more like five months, right? It's it's about seven and about five on either side of that seventh year. So you see, what do we see? At the end of the sixth year of seals, the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion. It's the Ezekiel 39 war. There's this destruction. The Antichrist is killed and many in war. The, 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 ten, uh, uh, the other 10 and the Antichrist aren't killed, but their dominions are taken away. But the Antichrist leader of all, he is killed. We know he's brought back when the pit is opened at mid-trumpets. But that means during the seventh year of seals, the Lord is here on heavenly Mount Zion. They saw him coming at the end of the sixth seal. The seventh year of seals starts with the 144, then the rapture of the great multitude. And then there's still the seventh seal. And in this seventh seal, you have silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. So that's in heaven. So on the earth, it's a representation, a typology of about half a year. Which means for the about six and about six or about seven months and about five months, the Lord is here and the events, these events are taking place. What is happening during this silence? What is happening during this event of silence? I believe this is when the Lord is making his covenant. This is when the Lord is coming to make the covenant that we've been sharing on over the years. It's the Jeremiah 31 new covenant that he makes. 
we even see, we've shared on this before, right? Right here in, in Jeremiah 31, 8. Behold, I will bring from the north country and will gather from the coast of the earth and, uh, uh, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travails together, a great company, which means what? A great multitude shall return hither. And when we saw it in the, um, in the uh, Septuagint translation, it said at Passover. Why? Because it's the picture of those who come in in the seventh year will come in. It'll be the end of the sixth year of seals and then about six, seven months to Passover, which is when the new wheat can finally be used. You see, we've shown that's why it's the seven days of affliction for the seven years typology which is related to unleavened bread for the house of Israel. This is that time. So this is the relation. This is directly, absolutely, Jeremiah 31, 8 is the rapture of the great multitude time. And then look what happens when we come down here. We come down to verse 31 of Jeremiah 31 and listen to what it says. So here you have just like Revelation 7, the great multitude rapture. And then at the seventh seal, there's that silence in heaven, which I believe relates to when this agreement, this new covenant is made. And listen to what it says. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Remember the house of Judah, as we were saying in the beginning, the house of Judah are also going to come because they know that their Messiah is the one who will destroy the enemies that destroyed them which happens at the end of the sixth year of seals and is then going to establish the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple. That is why everybody misses the first seven years because the Jews are only looking for the time when the enemies will be destroyed and the new temple will re be rebuilt and they've all missed the first seven years. You see, and here it is after the great multitude rapture that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they, which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is the towards the end of the seventh year of seals. Okay, so what are we seeing? We are clearly seeing that the Lord himself is here during the seventh year of seals. Heavenly Mount Zion has been made known, the 144,000 sealed after the destruction, the great multitude rapture. He makes a covenant. And then what happens? Then the beginning of trumpet starts. And when the beginning of trumpets begins, what do we know in, Revel in, in Zechariah chapter 8? How does trumpets begin? There's the Lord on heavenly Mount Zion. Now over Jerusalem, whatever that's going to look like. And what does he tell them? Let your hands be strong, right? Let your hands be strong. You that hear in these days the words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was built, which we know is built in Zechariah chapter four, which is the fourth year of seals, when the foundation would be laid. And it's modern day Zerubbabel who's going to do it. You see, so we knew, we have known for a long time that the revelation of the end of days of the Lord being here for the one year in the seventh year of seals before he completes his about three and a half years in the first half of trumpets will complete his seven years. If it's about three and a half years and about three and a half years will complete his seven years of ministry that began a year after he came on the scene. What happened with the story of John? You see, this is, we shared this in the last video. What happened? 
John was not yet in prison. The Lord had finished his 40 days in the wilderness. Here he is baptizing with his disciples. And John is in another area with his disciples baptizing, right? And he says, don't worry about him. He says, the one who has the bridegroom, he is the bride. So this all happened for about a two-month period of time. This was the revelation that we were speaking about recently that was so mind-blowing because we've been teaching on it for years that Jesus and John, from when Jesus showed up to when John um, was taken into prison, was a period that was about two months long. And we taught from this, knowing that he had been in prison for about 10 months. This was extremely important because we can see by seeing other people's studies that have been done for, throughout the decades, knowing, in fact, the truth of Jesus' birth. We know it in the year count to the Shemitah years, to the Sabbath years. But what happened was the revelation of the end of days proved to us that the Messiah was going to be here for one year, that seventh year of rest, before he began his about final three and a half years, which would complete his previous about three and a half years, that when it was done, it would be the end of a seven-year total. But if the end of days proved that he was here for one year before he worked, then what was it when he was here the first time? Well, we know it was two months and then 10 months, and we've now known that for a few years, proven by the end of days being a pattern of what happened before. So if it was about one year and then his ministry, then it was about one year and then John was, was, was uh, beheaded, then everybody turned to Christ and it was one, two, three years, and about a half. Exactly the truth to his death and resurrection in 33 AD. But the only way that could be true is that this one year wasn't when Jesus turned 30 at his birthday being 3-0. And you guys know this that have been following for the last little bit. It says when Jesus himself began to be about 30. And this is where the entire world thinks that it's like us when I turned. So I was 29, I did 365 days, and bang, I turned 30. And now it was shortly after my 30th birthday. That is wrong, as we have recently revealed. You begin to turn 30 the day after you've completed 29 years not after you turn 30, because when you turn 30, you have completed 30 years, which means Jesus began to be about 30, means he had completed his 29th year, or completed and had his 29th birthday, and he was shortly into his 30th year, you follow? When we understood that, we now had the revelation of Luke, chapter 3, proving that he began to be 30, meaning he was 29 years completed, and he was starting his 30th year in 28 AD. And why was this important for us? Why did it matter that it was 28 AD? Well, going into Luke 3, we see that it was in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, check this out. When they found the coins and they did the testing on the Shroud of Turin and all the technology that they could do now, they noticed the dates on the coins that would have been around the, his eyes or over the area of his eyes, and they were able to read the markings on the coins. And this guy says, I was privileged to have first correctly dated the coin by identifying the Greek letters on the back indicating that it was struck, listen to this, in the 16th year of Tiberius, or 29 AD. 
16th year of Tiberius, 29 AD. Well, Luke chapter 3 was the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And if the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar, when he made that coin for his wife in the 16th year, was 29 AD, then the 15th year was 28 AD, which means in the 28, in 28 AD, Jesus began to be 30, which means he was 29 complete, and he was in the early days of his 30th year. When we did that, look at what exactly the count gave us. 28 AD, Jesus began to be 30 years of age. Why 28 AD? Because the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar would have been in 28 AD because this in the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar was 29 AD. Hello. I told you guys, every piece of this is in order. And so if Jesus began to be 30 in 28 AD, right at the time of the Feast of Weeks, to the Feast of Weeks of 29 AD, guess what happened? Jesus then completed his 30th year. So he celebrated, quote unquote, his 30th birthday in 29 AD at the Feast of Weeks, okay? So at, what happened during this year? He was baptized. He was baptizing with his disciples and with John in another area was doing his thing during the first two months. And then for 10 months, John was in prison. And at the end of about one year, John is beheaded. Now, all those people that were still following and turning to John, visiting him in prison and doing all these things and updates on Jesus and Jesus giving updates to John and so forth by relaying messages back and forth. John has now been beheaded. When John is beheaded, now everybody turns to Jesus. So from about the time of the Feast of Weeks of 29 AD to 30 AD, one year, Jesus' ministry where John is no longer around. Two years without John. Three years without John and about a half. It was probably like 10 months or so, nine, 10 months, okay? So what do you have? You had one year, then three years and change. This was the absolute confirmation of the revelation of the end of days that was him here for the seventh year of seals, then him beginning the about final three and a half years, completing his ministry of seven years. You see? One year, about three and a half. One year, about three and a half. Why? Because nothing new under the sun. Okay? Ecclesiastes 1.9. The thing that has been, shall be. The thing that is, shall be. Remember, we've said these things over and over and over again. It's the same picture that you get with John the Baptist. You see, when we share in Luke chapter 3, we know that this is a typology of Jesus coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. But in the was that happened, it's a picture of the beginning of his ministry, right? With John being there and so forth. You see, but in the end of days, it's actually also a picture of the end of seals. So you have this duality. There are prophecy. There's, there's layers within the prophecy. Just like what it means for the difference of those two months, right? So if we know it was two months, then we know it was 10. This brings us to, of course, Matthew chapter four. What does it mean to us prophetically in the end of days? When John was now cast into prison. If John was cast into prison about two months from when Jesus was baptized, right? And in Matthew chapter 4, knowing that it was about two months after John had been cast into prison, we see that Jesus shows up and fulfills the is of the was. Yet we know it's prophecy of the is to come. What did he fulfill in this? Knowing that it equaled not directly at his birthday, but about two months later, 
because it's connected to John going to prison, he fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9. And again, I know we've covered this many times lately, but it's part of the storyline. So what do we know that he fulfilled? Well, he fulfilled right here, for unto us a child is born, and it said that he would be the great light coming and shined, right? In the land of Zebulun and of Tali. And it was, it was Matthew chapter 4 that just revealed to us the revelation that, of course, he didn't come at his birth. He came when he was older, when he was in his 30th year, from 29 to 30 years completed. And we know that it was about two months. Because Matthew chapter 4 said now John was in prison, and this is when Jesus showed up to fulfill unto us a child is born. Yet it clearly wasn't at his birth. Right? And it was to fulfill this. Well, we know the revelation of the end of days, which was the revelation as it was that happened here in the typology. And what did it show us? It just proved to us that if Jesus was born on the 15th day of Savan, and we know he's coming after the light affliction in northern Israel, and he's coming for 40 days, typology connected to his birth, as Isaiah 9, which isn't really at his birth, but is revealed to us in Matthew 4, that when he fulfilled that, was about two months later after John was taken into prison, then what we were looking for was not his birth, but that he would come about two months later related to the 40 days of the Son of Man coming, which we know is seven to the eighth day after what? The pre-trib happens, the ninth of Av, light affliction happens in northern Israel that we have been teaching will be Tel Aviv and Haifa for years to which he returns then after seven to the eighth day, which is precisely two months later. And it's exactly from the seventh to the eighth day, from the light affliction of the ninth of off of the 50 day count of the fifth and the seventh month. <laughs> this always gets me so fired up because it is impossible. Do you understand? It is 100% impossible to have this connection if we are not counting from Taurus as it was in the beginning, as it was to Moses, as it was to Noah. When we count from Sivan, from his birthday, from the typology of the resurrection, just as the Jews would to say that they die at the time of their birth for all of these people in the old testament if we connect that to the is to come revelation of the end bringing it all the way back to the beginning do you realize every single count that i have shown you to this year's calendar is all right in its place absolutely every single one of them the light affliction him coming at the eighth day, which is two months later after his birthday, which would be the seventh to the eighth day when he comes to start his 40 days, which is the seventh to the eighth day after the escape in the light affliction on Israel. And then what happens? The big attack happens on the 50th day from the first attack. And it's Syria that comes. When are we told Syria comes? We're told Syria comes. Look at this. Look at this. We're told Syria comes when they will be victorious because of the pride and pomp of the Jews. We're told that Syria comes at the end of the year. Well, to the Jews, right, to the house of Judah, the end of the year is Elul 29 and Tishri 1 starts. But look at what this word end of the year also means. It also means, there it is, right? The circuit of time, right? The, the course, the lapse of time for the year. And to the house of Judah, what is the year's end? Ta-da! This is the year's end to Judah. 
when Syria comes. The only way this literally counts is if we count from Taurus, which leads us directly to the end of the wheat harvest for the unleavened, uh, for the leavened bread, two loaves, which is in our physical reality, the literal time of the end of the wheat harvest, which leads us 50 days later to the literal end of the time of the wine harvest and the celebration of new wine, which takes us directly from the first attack, the beginning of 50 days, to the last attack after the Holy Ghost anointing at new wine, which would then begin the attack and the start of 14 years at the start of the Hebrews years count. The only way this is true and that it will happen is if this is the 70th year. You see? So all of this, there's not a blip, there's not a there's not a anything missing. But we can prove the things that the church aren't showing. And then those that bring about some of these revelations, we can add greater clarity to them, like the understanding of that one year. Which still clears everything precisely to where they show it. You see, what is the difference in this piece here? The understanding of the beginning of Luke chapter 3. You must understand this to be able to properly line up the rest of the story so that it is all perfectly in order. The 15th year of Tiberius Caesar was 28 AD. Because the 16th year, which is when those coins were minted, was 29 AD in the 16th year of Tiberius Caesar. Which means when Luke began to be 30 and was baptized, it was in 28 AD. So if it was in 28 AD and we follow the teaching that this guy was even showing, showing that it was at the time of the third month, uh, the 15th day, then it was 29 AD. Uh-oh. How is he going to account for four and a half years, about four and a half years? They will always be one year short. But you know how you can get around that? Is you ignore that the chapter starts with the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, and you simply say, oh, it's when Jesus is turned actually 30 years old, like we would do when we, when we turn 30. That's the only way you get around it. But it's not the greater, it's not the revelation of it. It's not the truth. It's just what gets them to here with about a three and a half year ministry. This is the greater revelation. And not discrediting any of this, but in fact, clearly proving it out and relating it to the end of days. So now what do we do? We continue on with the Shemitah year counts. We continue on dot, 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 all the way to what? When Israel becomes a nation. We now come to the point where Israel becomes a nation. And we see these 70s all over the place, right? Well, let me start with one that will bring a little bit more exciting excitement into the mix. Okay, let's go to Genesis chapter, oops. Yeah, Genesis chapter 11. Okay, we're going to see this, what we were talking about earlier, this layering of revelation, meaning one is a typology, but the other is also a typology. Okay. We see that Terah lived, okay, this is Abraham's father. He lived, well, lo and behold, 70 years, okay? What are we looking for? We're looking for a count that gives us 70 years. But what do we get at this 70 years? We get Abraham, who is represented as the father, right? Which is, which is a typology, you can say is the typology even as Christ or the father. But you have this typology of Abraham who represents Matthew's group. Then you've got his other brother, and his other brother is Nahor. And he's got 
another brother, another brother called Haran. Okay, it goes Haran, Nahor, Abraham. We've shown the revelation of this, that it's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Abraham represents Matthew, right? The Jews. Nahor represents Snorer, right? Isn't that awesome? I remember when the guys first found this. Nahor means Snorer. Well, what does Mark represent? The world, the church that is asleep. You hear people talk about it all the time. They're asleep. They're not prepared for what's coming. They're not diligent. They're not praying. They're not, they're not watching. So they're what? They're snoring. They're asleep and not prepared. This is the Mark group. And then this is the Luke group. And what do we know about the Luke group? We know, as we've shared from other people's websites, that the original Christians were called 14thers. And here we are, a group watching and praying, I believe being prepared and prepared as workers. And Haran means mountaineer. What does mountaineer mean? Mountaineer is those who climb the mountains. And we know that there's a group of people around the world, but in particularly, in particular in the US, who are called 14ers who climb mountain peaks that are 14,000 feet high. What are the chances of that? They are a representation of Luke's group. It doesn't mean everybody of 14 is only represented by them. These are groups within the groups. So you got Luke, Mark, Matthew. And the story begins at 70 years. 70 years, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And how does the story begin with Haran? Haran's the first one to die. Well, how about that? Right? Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died. Haran is the first one to die, the first one to go. It's funny how that works, right? Because Luke is the first one. Luke is pre-trib. But what happens? There's a remnant group. And the remnant workers from that group are the ones who are the first ones to die out of the workers from Mark's group and then Matthew's group. And now check this out. There's a reason why I'm bringing you to this. Not only in this typology of the 70 and then Luke's group, Mark's group, Matthew's group, there's still more to it, right? Then he takes, um, uh, so then what happens is after he dies, Abraham and Nahor take themselves wives and they take them from um, Haran's uh, daughters, okay? Uh, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, okay? They take him from Nahor's family. And they take Lot, who is Haran's son, okay? Interesting, because what do we know with Abraham? What do we know with Lot? What are they kind of like the descendants, right? Those left in, the, in that church age, that period of time, okay? Well, watch what happens now, and this is why I'm bringing this up. So we do have a 70 and then a picture of all three groups. But then when we go to chapter 12, we have the story of Abraham. And this is something people have been sharing a little bit uh, here and there. And I saw it a couple of times in the forum. And I wanted to share this. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, it says, So Abraham, actually, let's start. Uh, yeah, let's start in verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country. Okay? So right out, get out of the country where your father is, right? They're getting out of the land where they were. And it says in verse two, and I will make thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thee a great, thy great, sorry, and make thy name great. And thou shall be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. See, pray for them. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham departed and the Lord had, uh, as the Lord had spoken unto him and Lot went with him. And Abraham was, 75 years old when he departed out of Haran, okay? He was 75 years old when he departed out of Haram. And in verse six, it says, and Abraham passed through the land into the place of Shechem, Shechem, okay? Shechem is, is the place of their promise, okay? This was the land that the Lord was promising to Abraham's descendants. 
How old was Abraham? 75 years old. Check this out about Abraham. This is going to blow some of you away. Okay? You can uh, go to chaba.org, and this is an article about Abraham's life. So we don't get a whole bunch of info about the first, uh, you know, 75 years of Abraham. There's very little. But the Jews, I think it's what is their midrash, right? In some of their Talmud and various midrashim, they, it's, it's writings that have been passed down through hundreds and thousands of years uh, from generation to generation to generation, talking about some of the, the main characters and the main events throughout history, okay, throughout their history. And this goes all into the events with Abraham, how he ended up going to be with Noah because of, of, um, uh, uh, of Nimrod and Nimrod's uh, council were saying that, you know, this guy, Abraham, who was born unto Terah, he's going to be an issue for, for you. So he went after him and then Abraham leaves and he goes into hiding. And there, there's a whole story of uh, a number of the, the, the years in between that happened with Abraham. But you got to remember, he was around because Noah was still alive. So Noah was alive, Shem was alive, and he went and actually spent some time and lived there with Noah for the years. Now, you got to remember, Noah also knew Adam. You see, this is something that always blows my mind because I forget, because we don't get all these details in the scripture, so we forget some of these things. But the connection, you know, with them living hundreds of years back then, they were around when some of them were around. So Noah had a firsthand account from Adam. And then Abraham has a firsthand account of the events that took place in the flood and what happened during Noah's time. And he has a secondhand account from learning from what Adam had told him. So Abraham had a ton of understanding and of information from the beginning of Adam and Eve. So it's really quite fascinating to see this, but I want you to see something else that is really awesome that people have been just casually sharing in this connection to the season and time we're living in. And a lot of people have known this over the years, but this connection is even better. So it says, Abraham, who was first called Abram, was born in the year 1948 after creation, right? 1813 BC. Now listen to this. According to one tradition, he was born in the month of Nisan. Listen to this. According to another, in the month of Tishri. What do you think the chances are that he was born in Tishri over Nisan? Hello. Do you get it? Do you understand that part of this connection in this, Adam rep uh, Abraham represents Matthew, Nahor represents the sleeping world Mark, and Haran represents Luke. Who's he a representation of? Matthew. It's a representation of Judah. What is Judah's portion? Tishri. He is a representation of, quote unquote, God's people, right? Relation to this portion with the house of Judah. The revelation of creation. The revelation of the 14, the pre and then the 14 years. Gentile bride, house of Israel, Gentiles grafted in, and Judah. What do you think the chances are that this is his birthday? At Tishri 1, at the time of Tishri. But check this out. Many people have heard of this over the years that he was born in 1948 years after creation, which is 1813 BCE. Remember, that was going forward from creation. This is going backwards counting in BC. Okay? So he was born in 1948. We all know that that's a big deal, right? Because Israel came back into the land in 1948. All you have to do is go back through and count it all. He was born in 1948. His father was 70. Okay, well, check this out. When Abraham was 75 years old, see, 
when Abraham first entered the land in 2023, in 1737, so 1737, 38, again, right? Those people with zero and so forth. Um, his first stop was the place of Shechem, where God appeared to him and promised to your descendants, will I give this land? To your descendants, will I give this land? Abraham was born in 1948, 75 years later. That looks like 2023 our time, right? No, it was 1736 BCE, but from Adam, it was 20, it was 2023 years later. Isn't that fascinating? Why is that so fascinating to us? Because we're living in 2023. They came into the land in 1948. Makes it what? 75 years. So what did it say? It said Abraham was 75 years old, right? You know what it means? He was in his 75th year. You following? He was in his 75th year. In the BC side, it's like you can say 75 and then you fulfill it because it's on the BC side. We did a video on that uh, just uh, two, three months ago, right? On the BC side, you turn it and then you fulfill it. On the AD side, you fulfill it. And then when you're, when you're celebrated that age, you've actually completed it. And that's what's caused confusion. So what do you think the chances are that him actually being connected to Tishri is when his 75th year would be complete because he represents what? The house of Judah. So his 75th year complete, and then what? He turned 75 and he's now started his 76th year. He was shown at what? 1948, 2023. Did I make this up? No, this is writings on all of these things. You can go into the whole story of all of this stuff. This is when he came into Shechem, uh, Shechem, the place that he was shown for his promise. It, it's almost like you have a typology with the Lord in here. He's being shown the land of his promise that, he, that is going to be their promise. But what do we know is coming this time? Destruction. It's still their promise. But they cannot remain in the land. Because they have been disobedient. So the land must rest for seven years before the Lord can return and build on that land. That the temple, the foundation can be laid, but the temple cannot be laid, uh, uh, built until the land has rested for seven years. Isn't that amazing that it lands 75 years? Right? It's 75 years from 1948. Right? Where is it? I, where did I bring it up? Okay. We all know when they came into the land in May of 1948, we've taught on this in the past. See, they had a provisional government. A provisional government means just like a, an in-between one until everything is established. It says, on the same date, the United States, in the person of President Truman, recognized the provisional government as the de facto authority of the Jewish state. Okay, so they were the de facto authority, meaning it wasn't really official, but we were recognizing it as a provisional government. It wasn't until it was de jure recognized, okay, after they had their elections on January 25th, that on January 31st, 1949, that they were then seen as the, legi the legitimate government. However, they hadn't yet officially taken office until the 8th of March. And on the 10th, 11th of March, the, um, the, the new Jewish government with B David Ben-Gurion tore up on the 10th or 11th of March tore up the provisional government document in 1949. But as we have taught, 
what do we know? They are Jews. They are a representation of the house of Judah, not the house of Israel. And without going through all this again, we know that the difference between the house of Israel and the house of Judah was how they counted their kings with accession and non-accession. We know that the house of Judah counts their years beginning from Tishri 1. Okay? We know now, going back <coughs> to the revelation of this, they came into the land of 1948. Okay? So when they came into the land in 1948, just like Abraham, 1948, 75 years later from 1948 is 2023. 48 to 23. What happened when he was 75 from 1948 in 2023? The Lord came and spoke to him and said, you see this land? This is the land that I promised to your descendants. You see? And are they going to get it right away? We know no. The destruction is coming. So you've got a typology within the 1948 in BC from Adam to 1948 in 75 more years to 2023 in the BC side of things, counting from Adam, the Lord shows up to him the first time and then tells him, here's the land that I'm going to give to your descendants. The promise. And what do we have? 75 years equals exactly from 1948 when they came into the land. The exact same count of everything we've been sharing on a 70 year time frame. 2023. When did they say that his birthday was? It was either Nisan or Tishri. He's a representation of Judah as God's people. What is he representing? Tishri. What, what does the house of Judah represent? What do they count their year from? A session. Tishri. What was, what was the entire count that we've been showing with the fifth and the seventh counting from Taurus? What did every single day equal? What did the harvest of the wheat what did the harvest of the grapes what did it all equal the count to tishri 75 years complete right here and bam destruction comes what now is the revelation to be able to understand the count of leviticus 19. what is this true count as we start to close this up in leviticus Chapter 19, let's make it crystal clear for everybody to see. When you come into the land, okay? When you come into the land. They came into the land May 14th, 1948. They officially were in the land. But it says, when you come into the land, what do you have to do? And shall have planted all manner of trees for food. Okay? When did they officially plant the trees for the new year of trees not until february 13th into the 14th of 1949 after um the elections had taken place right at the new year of trees which means what they came into the land in 1948 but their count didn't yet begin because they also needed to plant trees so even though they came in in May of 1948, and you would think, well, in the accession year, <coughs> right? So if they planted, or sorry, they came into the land. Let's look, look at this as 1948. So they came into the land on May 14th of 1948. You would think by Tishri time that this would be the accession time, and they would start to count from September-ish, right? Tishri of 1948. But they couldn't because it says when you come into the land and have planted all manner of trees. Well, if this is 1948 and now we go to 1949, they didn't plant all manner of trees until the 13th, 14th at the New Year of Trees in February of 1949. So the year count, according to Leviticus, when they came into the land, that's when they came into the land in 1948, but they also needed to plant all manner of trees before this period could start. 
Then, on March 8th of 1949, he officially takes office, rips up the provisional government, and then everybody would say, see, that's year two, or one year complete by May of 1949. But it's not true. Because they are the house of Judah. So some might have even said, ah, you know, if they do non-accession as the house of Israel did, then in non-accession, year one is complete, right? Because non-accession, they count those few months as year one. So they would have said, see, year two begins at Passover in 1949. That's not true because they're the house of Judah. So they had to come into the land. They had to plant all manner of trees. They took office, but they're the house of Judah. So they didn't actually begin starting to count year one. All of this was just a session. And they didn't begin to count their first year until Tishri 1 of 1949, according to historical accession, non-accession year counts, and according to Leviticus 19, that said, even though you came into the land here in 1948, you still had to plant all manner of trees. You see? Which means they planted all manner of trees, but year one didn't begin till here. So that means... In September of 1949, or Tishri 1, whatever it was in 1949, started year one. So when they got to the new year of trees of 1950, that means one new year of trees has now passed, okay? But that means it was in the first year. You following? So then you go to 1950 Tishri, and one year is complete, and now they're in their second year. And the second year of the new year of trees is complete while in the second year of their count from the house of Judah, from Tishri. Okay? Now they complete two. Now they're in their third year. And in their third year, the third year is complete of the new year of trees. So the third year of the new year of trees is complete while in the third year since they've come into the land and their official count began. You see, what is this revelation? It's exactly what we read here. So it says, all manner of trees for food, then shall you count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised three years, shall it be as uncircumcised unto you and shall not eat uh, and shall not be eaten of. Now listen to this. Here's the revelation. Remember I said earlier in the beginning when I was talking on Leviticus 19, there's these little intricate details. And in this case, it's the word in. In. Do you realize the only way it could be in the fourth year for them? Okay, listen to what it says. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord with all. Which means the, the whoops, which means the fourth, or sorry, which means the fourth year of the new year of trees is completed, yet it's still in their fourth year. The only way that happens, and we're still here right now is if it is the house of Judah, a session year count, which means they don't count the beginning of their year until they came in the land, they had to plant. Okay, now we've planted, now we've got our government, now we can start, but our year doesn't start till Tishri. So now we gotta wait till Tishri, and at Tishri one, we begin to count year one, which means you begin to count in Tishri at about September of 1949, and when you get to the new year of trees a few months later, in January, February of 1950, <coughs> that one year of trees being planted is complete, but you're still in the first year. So what happens? The fourth year of the new year of trees is complete in the fourth year from them counting 
as Judah a session. You see, listen to this. Here it is right here. 1948, they come into the land. 1949, you see the green. Let me show you. The green, let me slide it over as well. Can I slide it over? Will it let me? Doesn't like it. No. So the green here of 1949 is when they planted trees. Okay? But it's not until, well, the Lord God we have as Feast of Weeks. Okay? But to the house of Judah, it's not until Tishri. Okay, so 1948 to 1949, that it wasn't year one. It was just them coming into the land. It was the accession time and they had to plant. So they planted in February of 1949. So here we are from New Year, uh, either Feast of Weeks to the Lord, but to Judah. Here we are, Tishri, beginning of Tishri 1949 to Tishri 1950. In this first official year, they observed the New Year of Trees, okay? 1949 to 1950, for Judah, Tishri to Tishri, in the midst of year one was first year of New Year of Trees. Tishri to Tishri, 1950 to 1951, in January, February, in the midst of the year, second year was complete for the New Year of Trees. Tishri of 1951 to Tishri of 1952, in the midst of that year, was the third year of the New Year of Trees, you see? So now in that third year, in their third year, they could not take from it these three years, right? Then what happens? Then it says, in the fourth year, which means Tishri of 1952 to Tishri of 1953, in that fourth year, they could not take of the fruit what did it what did they have to do it said it was to be brought to the lord it was holy unto the lord and it said what in the fourth year you see it's right here in the fourth year all the fruit thereof is holy to praise unto the lord look at lo and behold from a tishri count with a session for judah as abraham is representing there is the fourth year. What is the fourth year? Tishri of 1952 to Tishri of 1953. Okay? And look at what we have. We have a Sabbath year. It was a Shemitah year in the fourth year. When did they count? When did the Jews count their Shemitahs? Uh, their, their Shemitah, their Sabbath years. Tishri to Tishri. They don't count them from Elul, uh, uh, from Nisan. They count them from Tishri to Tishri. Why do you think they do that? Because they are the house of Judah. So then what did it say? What's the next verse say? In verse 25 of Leviticus 19, and in the fifth year, you shall eat the fruit thereof. So from the fifth year forward, it's now theirs to eat. Well, lo and behold, the fifth year just so happened in, whoops. Why are you doing that? Oh, come on now. Let's go over here. No, can't do that. Okay, so it just so happens that on a perfect Sabbath Shemitah year count from Christ, the fifth year that is theirs is 1953, Tishri 1 to 1954 is the fifth year that the Lord said, you can now eat of the tree. So in the new year of trees of 1954, they were now able to eat from the tree in their fifth year, which is what? The first year that becomes theirs. And it's the beginning of a new Shemitah year cycle, a new Sabbath year cycle. And look at that. There's your count. And when you do that count, just as it states, we end up 
with the end of 289 Sabbath years from Christ that revealed the three plus one that then led us to Leviticus 19 that showed us the three plus one, then the fifth year forward was theirs, brings us to the end of 70 years, to the end of the Sabbath year of rest that we are in right now that must take place before we can have the final seven Sabbaths of years of seven and seven perfectly connected to the 70 years of Israel counted as the Lord told them to do in Leviticus and yet at the same time from the Abraham 1948 connection 75 years five years just as it was to their count here equals then 2023 what do we have remember i said it was like an overlaying prophecy the 75 years to abraham perfectly from 1948 yet a biblical count of when you come into the land how to your year to observe it and when it becomes yours to count we are literally in the 70th year from when they came into the land properly counted the 75th year from abraham him showing them the land that will be theirs in the promise at the return of the lord feet down on the mount of olives you see return feet down compared to his return on heavenly mount zion brothers and sisters this chart is nothing that skips a beat from the creation uh, uh, from the birth of christ to the beginning of his ministry to luke to to the death of john the baptist to jesus taking over to 33 a.d to the direct correlation in luke to the end of days that one year finishing his ministry to leviticus 19 understood in order so that we could know it is the 70th year yet at the same time have a direct correlation to abraham where the 70th year in the revelation of all scripture 70 is also the 75th year of abraham both equaling 2023 for which both of them end on a little 29 with the destruction and 14 years beginning at Tishri 1 over and over and over again these 70 years in Zechariah chapter 1 Psalms 90 and 10 70 to 80 years is labor and sorrow which means tribulation then it is soon cut off so 10 years and a short period of time of a few months then we fly away that means what 10 years and about six months which brings it to mid trumpets and then cut off and fly away. what does that mean if 10 years are done these about six months is in the 11th year you see that means 10 has been complete and 10 years and a few months is the few months being in the 11th year and then we fly away we all know that this is directly related to revelation chapter 12 when they fly away on the wings of an eagle into the wilderness for a time and times and half a time the final three and a half years they are the final three and a half years of this revelation right here, which is 10 years, about six months, which is in the 11th year. And we fly away, which is three and a half years for a total of 14 years. For a total of what? From the end of 70? Leaves what? Leaves the total of 14 years to an end of another 70 for Judah, which on its own is the other revelation 
of Daniel 9 that they would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem, which we've been able to show the 70 weeks determined to make an end, to bring everlasting righteousness. That word, listen to this. <clears throat> listen to this, listen to this. In Daniel, oh, let's see, my scroll's not working. In Daniel chapter 9, okay, and let's actually go to Jeremiah 25. Watch this, in Jeremiah 25. In Jeremiah 25, <clears throat> when it says to, uh, from the north, to bring in uh, them to astonishment, to utterly destroy, where is the word I was looking for? To accomplish, okay? To accomplish, to bring to an end, to accomplish, right? To complete. When we go to Daniel chapter 9, we have the same word that's used, right? To accomplish, to accomplish the 70 years in the desolations. What is it? Is it this 70? We know this is one of the 70s, but it just so happens that this, at the end of the 14 years, which is the revelation of Daniel 9 and the events that take place, which is Psalms 90 and 10. The Psalms 90 and 10 on their own is the revelation of the end of days. Well, check this out. Here's a great one that I love to show to people when they say, oh, you're crazy. This 14 year stuff is just a bunch of hocus pocus. Psalms 90 and 10. You see, um, uh, uh, Abraham was 75. So that 70 to 80 is really uh, 75. Really? Then why does it say from 70 to 80? <laughs> from 70 to 80 is 10 years. Then the soon is a few months, which is a portion of the 11th year, which is mid-trumpets when Messiah is cut off because the temple was built. Let me prove it to you. You guys all love this one. You know it. <clears throat> First Kings chapter 6, verse 37. In the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid in the month of Ziph. Well, isn't that fascinating? Isn't that precisely what we show happens in the fourth year? What happens in the fourth year? Zechariah chapter 4 says that Zerubbabel had laid the foundation. Then what does it say? And in the eleventh year, the month of Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished. In the 11th year, meaning it was seven years in building. What does it mean, in the 11th year? You know what in the 11th year means? 10 years and soon, then it's cut off. This is 10 years and in the 11th year, soon cut off and we fly away. What does it tell you? The total was 11 years before the, before the temple was completed. The revelation is what? Fourth year, the foundation is built. And by the 11th year, right here, which is after 10, in the 11th year, at mid-trumpets, 10 and a half years into tribulation, after this first 70 is complete in 2023, at the time of Tishri, at the year's end, when the destruction by Ishmael slash north slash Syria Assad comes. 11 years, or in the 11th year, which is about 10 and a half years in, the temple will have been completed from what? Remember what happened in chapter 8 of Zechariah? The Lord is there now on heavenly Mount Zion. He told them, let your hands be strong, because now they're going to what? Build the temple that was laid on the foundation in the midst of seals now the temple is going to be built and it's going to be what in the 11th year that it's built what happens in the 11th year cutoff happens the fifth trumpet happens and the pit is opened messiah is cut off and satan is going to have been cast down the pit is going to be open 
And what happens for two and a half years of the final three and a half years? We know that this flyaway from Revelation chapter 12, okay, from Revelation chapter 12 is three and a half years, the time, comma, and times, and half a time. One plus two plus a half. That's three and a half years. That'll bring you to the end of the 14 years. But Satan's time from when Messiah is cut off, just as we saw literally in 1 Kings chapter 6, just as we saw the 10 and soon cut off, is in the 11th year. We know Satan doesn't get to rule over the final three and a half years, but Satan will get, as we know, not all of the final three and a half years. He gets the final two and a half of the three and a half years, which is right here in Daniel 12, 7. How long shall it be that it shall, and he says that it shall be for time, times, and a half. One, two, plus a half. There's no end here. He's going to have two and a half years to scatter the power of the holy people, and all these things shall be finished. When are all these things finished? At the end of the sixth trumpet. Isn't that amazing? Because just as it happened at the end of seals, what happened? The Lord was seen coming on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth year of seals and was here for the seventh year, setting things up, establishing things. What? Just as the law said in the seventh year of rest for the land, right? Then what happened? The rebuilding takes place for about three and a half years into the 11th year until the cutoff happens. They're going to fly away on wings of eagles, on wings of the eagle for the final three and a half, for which Satan is going to have two and a half of those years with the pit open, with Antichrist coming back, all of that stuff. And at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, hello, at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, to start the seventh year of trumpets, the Lord is going to what? He is going to return. He is going to return, as Zechariah says, this time, not on heavenly Mount Zion with paradise where the rapture group was taken, but he's going to be what? Coming feet down on the Mount of Olives, just as Zechariah 14 has told us. It is awesome, brothers and sisters. The story is here. As you know, I can go on and on, but I think this is a great place to end it. The revelation is here. The revelation is understood. There is no way around this 70th year being the 70 from Leviticus 19 in the count. There is no way around showing even this, this additional connection of Abraham 1948 to find out 75 years later when the Lord appears to him is 2023 in the BC side of things. All of it, guys, is leading us to this period of time we have understood and revealed in the revelation of the Shemitah year counts. Did you see that? Every piece is here. All of it is in order. Even Jerusalem began a new Shemitah year count. Why? Because when its 70 years are over, when does it have to end? A Shemitah year count. 70 years is 10 sevens. Do you understand how that couldn't have been in the midst of a cycle of Shemitahs? Do you understand that in the revelation of the final 14 years, even in somebody's seven-year thinking, it must be that we are in the end of a Shemitah cycle so that when the tribulation begins, it must be the beginning of a cycle? Do you realize that it is only the house of Judah 
that counts their cycles starting from Tishri? And every single thing we've revealed here tonight is a count to every feast of the wheat harvest, of the wine harvest, of the bringing in of the leavened bread, of the bringing in of the new wine, is the count to the first attack, is the count to the second attack, is the count to the Lord two months difference in the revelation of Leviticus 9, is the count to 75 years complete for Abraham. It's the whole thing. All of it is connected to this count in the revelation of Jesus' birthday, counting Savan as the beginning of the year to the Lord God, as it was in the beginning. For anybody that's new, I'm going to finish right here. Because the Lord told us the beginning and the end and the end from the beginning. And what do we see in the beginning? What is the beginning? The beginning is Hebrews 72, 25, like we began it in the beginning. And what is in the beginning? It means Jesus. What does that mean to be able to say it's Jesus? Jesus is the feast of first fruits right jesus is the bread without leaven and look at what it is the feast of first fruits is jesus and in the beginning it was in taurus and creation started on the 16th day in the month of taurus and when we go back to the beginning and count from the beginning lo and behold brothers and sisters what do we get we get the exact count to the final two harvest dates that equal the attacks that are told to us in Scripture that reveal them both in the count of Judah, who are the ones in the land that equals from 48 to 49, giving us the count, every single part and piece in order. And as much as we didn't need to go all the way back to the create uh, to the birth of Christ. All we truly needed was the understanding of Leviticus 19. The revelation of the end revealed us all the way back in order to the birth of Christ. Every part and piece in order, brothers and sisters. So I say one more time here tonight, hold on, be strengthened, watch and pray always, be diligent, Okay, keep strengthening, keep lifting each other up. Come join us in the forum. If you can, support us here with GoFundMe or PayPal or our info is in the description box under these videos so that we can continue to support our brother Steve in Uganda and getting the word out and getting the revelation of the book. They are eating up the revelation for those who have the Bibles and more Bibles to those who don't yet have them. Brothers and sisters, he has a huge conference coming up here in early July. Let us help him make it a great one. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.